Hello, Poonam. How are you? <laughs> so, a very good evening to all. A warm welcome to one and all to the international webinar on neonatal emergencies organized by Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses. The society is organizing various webinars with the aim to update clinical nursing officers' knowledge and to make them aware about the recent and current changes and advancement in, uh, advancement in our profession. Society is always trying to bring people who are working at various branches of nursing, like in clinical side, teaching side, research side, etc. And these people are either working nationally or internationally and utilize eminent people from these groups to update others in our profession. So today, Indian, uh, uh, Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses is organizing webinar on neonatal emergencies. As we all know, newborn are the babies who all are less than 28 days of their life. The first month of their life is the most vulnerable period of child survival. As per WHO, 47% of under five mortality in 2020 is contributed by neonatal death. And this figure is an increase from 40% uh, in the year 2020. Pre-temper, intrapartum hemorrhages and complications like birth asphyxia, infections, birth defect are the leading cause of most of the neonatal death. Neonatal mortality occurred due to the conditions associated with lack of quality of care, either immediately after the birth or in the first few days of life. In order to promote newborn health and to prevent newborn death, quality care is needed to be provided. Here comes our role. We, as a frontline warriors, should have correct and adequate knowledge for caring sick newborns and to bring them back to the life. I hope. At the end of this webinar, all of you will be updated about the management uh, guideline for at least some of the neonatal emergency conditions. So without wasting much of our time, I'm moving forward with the proceedings. So I am Bili Venugopal. On behalf of Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses, express my immense pleasure to welcome our dignitaries, resource persons, organizing team, and of course, the participants to the webinar. First of all, I would like to welcome Dr. Poonam Joshi Maam, who is currently working as Professor Come Principal at College of Nursing, AIMS, Kalyani, West Bengal. Previously, Maam was working as Associate Professor at College of Nursing, AIMS, New Delhi. Maam has published more than 81 research papers and articles in national and international journals. She is holding different positions in various professional bodies. Mom is the academic chairperson for Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses also. Mom is the master trainer in essential and newborn care, essential and newborn care IMNCI, Global Fund for AIDS, TB, Malaria. Mom is also a certified trainer for neonatal resuscitation program, DCLS, ACLS course. She has written various textbooks uh, in pediatric nursing, manual for pediatric and neonatal nursing, nursing education, monogram uh, in diabetics and its management. She has won various awards in the field of nursing. Mom, we are lucky to have you during this webinar. Mom is specialized in pediatric nursing. Mom, I would like to extend warm welcome to you from my side and also on behalf of Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses. And I request you to I and I request you for the presidential address. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Miss Ambly, for your kind words. I, on behalf of uh, ISECN, um, welcome each one of you uh, in this webinar. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, welcome our speakers for the day, Miss Jessie, uh, Miss Anu, uh, Miss Dolma, and Miss Divya. Um, it's after a long time I'm, I'll be seeing Ms. Divya Stephen uh, in this uh, forum. So we are thankful to you for uh, having agreed to this uh, webinar. And, and I also welcome our participants um, 
who are there to attend this webinar. So as uh, Ms. Ambli said, neonatal period is the most vulnerable period and it contributes to uh, significant under five morbidity and mortality. Anytime they can deteriorate very fast, it's very difficult uh, to uh, assess them uh, clinically at times. Uh, maybe they are looking very um, stable to us uh, just five minutes back and within a few minutes, you will find them deteriorating very fast. So uh, providing care to a neonate, especially in emergency, in the emergency department is a unique and a very difficult challenge for all the healthcare professionals. Um, so as uh, the healthcare team members, we have to get familiarized with the, the common problems these neonates can have. And uh, we should also be equipped with the, with the knowledge required for extensive history and uh, uh, history taking and then uh, doing the physical examination because these two things are going to help us a lot in the long run uh, while stabilizing the baby. So I'm thankful to ISECN uh, who have been periodically organizing uh, sessions and uh, for past five, six webinars, I have seen them covering uh, various uh, emergencies. So uh, in this platform today, we are going to learn about um, neonatal emergencies and uh, we are very lucky to have very experienced personnel with us. Um, with these words, I would like to hand over to Ms. Ambly. And uh, I congratulate once again to the society. And as well as I'm uh, very happy to see the overwhelming response shown by our participants. And they have been showing uh, very good attendance in all the previous webinars. So over to Ms. Ambly. Thank you, Ma. Thank you for enlightening us with the importance of this webinar. Next, I would like to extend special welcome to our beloved mom, Dr. Penny George, ma'am, who is currently working as principal in College of Nursing, ILBS, New Delhi. We are so fortunate to have you, a person like you, with immense knowledge in pediatric nursing for this webinar. Dr. Penny George, ma'am, declared Undergraduate and post-graduation from RK College of Nursing, MPhil from Manipal College of Nursing, and PhD from University of Kerala. She got Sick Care Baby Unit Certificate from Royal Hospital Oman, currently holding various positions in different professional bodies and organizations. She has nearly 34 years of experience in nursing profession. She has many research papers published in national and international journals. Despite of her busy schedule, in the ever first attempt we made to conduct her as a chief guest for this webinar, she agreed and offered all the support for conducting this webinar. I, on behalf of Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses, welcome you and request you for the inaugural address. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Hope I'm audible. Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Good afternoon to one and all here and uh, at the outset I would like to thank uh, the organizers, the society, uh, uh, Ambli in particular uh, for having thought of me and having invited me for this particular uh, uh, topic on uh, neonatal emergencies. Uh, the moment I heard this I was a bit exuberant about uh, this because uh, uh, it, it's a very passionate area for me. I worked in the neonatal units in, in the Sultanate of Oman for quite many years. And uh, I always have a fond memory of having worked in these, uh, these areas. And you can do a lot for these babies. And uh, another area of uh, mine which I uh, fondly carry around is uh, adolescent uh, in, uh, medicine. And uh, so this is one area. So that was one reason why I readily accepted to it because yes, of course, I would like to know. And you have brought in the panel, people working hands-on in the area. And uh, 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 my congratulation goes to all of you out there because we speak many things from the books, you speak from your clinical experience. So uh, having said that, I would like to thank, once again, thank the organizers, uh, Dr. Poonam Joshi, uh, the president of the event, uh, 
the uh, speakers of today, each and every one of you uh, who are taking different sessions, and of course the participants who have, um, as I hear from you, who are regular on these events, and uh, which goes to say we are in safe hands, or our children are in safe hands. So uh, with that, I would like to say I'm, I'm really honored uh, and I'm privileged to be with you today. And I won't take much of your time. I would like that uh, uh, PPT uh, first slide to be shared, please. <clears throat> the second one. Can we move over to the second one? <clears throat> I just thought today I'll just bring up this particular poem. Uh, with I, which I felt was very apt for today. It is the, the, the poem is named Infant Joy or it is about an infant called Joy written by William Blake. He has, it, the poem is very big, but I've just taken a few lines. Uh, the baby says, I have no name. I'm but two days old. Uh, what shall I call thee, says the mother. The baby says, I'm happy. Joy is my name. So the mother says, Sweet joy befall thee. So, uh, the next slide, please. So, here the poet talks about a baby who is helpless uh, and cannot speak for itself. So, the word infant uh, comes from uh, Latin infants, which means unable to speak. So an infant is without a name and without a voice, but in infant joy, in the poem, infant joy, uh, uh, can we just wait a few moments, please? So uh, in infant joy, the poem, the, the poet says, is giving a voice to this particular baby. And uh, which means he lends a voice to these voiceless children. And I think today's your endeavor to have brought up this uh, neonatal emergencies is nothing but you're giving voice to these voiceless children. And I commend you all for having picked up this, uh, this particular topic and all those speakers uh, who, who are going to enlighten us on many of these uh, aspects. The next slide, please. And having said that, one more thing I would like to highlight here is to remember always that the mother knows the best for her baby. So learn to listen. It would be a, a next uh, message that I would like to leave with you. The next slide, please. So, and the third point I would like to leave with you all is, uh, remember the golden hour of the neonatal life, which is the first hour of postnatal life for both maybe preterm and term babies. And as Ambli, aptly said initially that uh, there are a lot of evidence-based interventions and that needs to be applied in that first 60 minutes of postnatal life of these babies. So having said that, the next slide. So the next slide, please. Uh, so many studies have uh, evaluated this concept of golden hour and has shown remarked uh, reduction, especially in the preterm neonates in terms of the hypothermia, hypoglycemia, interventricular hemorrhage, uh, bronchopulmonary uh, dysplasia, and uh, retinopathy, uh, uh, prematurity. Uh, so what I uh, want to highlight here is that golden hour, though some of our topics may not be the initial one hour, but still I thought that's something very relevant for today's lesson. And uh, the next slide, please. So uh, I will uh, like to leave you with some of these components. It starts from the antenatal period to the team knowing what to do for these babies, uh, to the delayed cold, uh, cord clamping, prevention of hypothermia, giving a respiratory support, cardiovascular support, prevention of hypoglycemia, or, uh, preventing early onset uh, sepsis. I think somebody is dealing on that today. Initiation of breastfeeding, prevention of infection, and doing a thorough newborn assessment, the laboratory investigations, monitoring and recording and communication with the family, which are some of the components that the golden hour should take care of. Uh, having said that, uh, so these are the key take home points I would like to tell you. Uh, to know we are going to support the, we are going to be the voice of these voiceless. To know that the parents 
uh, opinions in children are important and to remember that it's a golden art which is important so I, I just would leave you with this image of a baby holding on to your hands as if to say don't go be my voice and with that i would like to uh, conclude and say uh, that uh, this program or this particular event is being inaugurated and I leave it to uh, these speakers who I would I know would definitely enlighten us and I'm waiting to hear you all. Thank you so much for having invited me and all the best for each and every one of you. You're all my friends in pediatrics. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for your kind words and enlightening us with the importance of various aspects of newborn care. So just uh, before moving to the uh, sessions, I just would like to highlight the aims and objectives of Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses. This society is meant for organizing seminars and training sessions with special emphasis on skill-based workshop, health-related panel discussion, and conferences, primarily for nurses, other healthcare providers and to the community. The main ob objective of our society includes refinement of nurses and nursing profession with autonomy, independence, and decision-making skill. Amelioration of professional condition of student nurses, nurses, nursing educators, researchers, and administrators in meeting their dynamic professional demands and challenges. Assistance in generation, communication, and utilization of birth and latest scientific evidences for all in nursing profession. Empowerment of community with health promotional attitude, information and abilities as an independent agency and in collaboration with various agencies accord. So without wasting much of our time, we are moving to the scientific sessions. So for the first session, our first session is on the topic neonatal asphyxia. Ms. Jessie Paul Mum, currently working as Senior Nursing Officer at Ames New Delhi, is going to discuss about the topic. She did her BSc from All India Institute of Medical Sciences New Delhi, MSc from RIK College of Nursing. Mum has also done Diploma in Hospital Management from NIHFW New Delhi. She, did, and then she is an NNF certified National Trainer for Neonatal Resuscitation Program. She is one of the national faculty for on-top course on essential newborn care for nurses. She also held various positions in different professional bodies. She is the recipient of Best uh, Research Nurse Award of Amesonians in the year 2017. I, on behalf of uh, Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses, welcomes you for the uh, session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Ambali, for that, uh, your gesture of introduction. Uh, I take the opportunity to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity and congratulate them for having been organizing this as a, such type of uh, sessions for the nurses working in the different units. So just let me share my screen. So the topic for given me is the neonatal asphyxia or asphyxia neonatal. We know birthing is one of the dangerous period of, in any human being's life. And as a pediatrician or as a uh, nurse midwife who is dealing with the birth of the baby, every day in and out, come confront with the babies who is have not initiated breathing or not able to sustain the breath. That is called as the birth asphyxia. With the uh, very uh, deleterious consequences and life, I mean, lifelong neuromotor disability. So we know that we as health, health, healthcare professionals, as a team has to be there for the smooth transition of the baby from the fetal life to the extra uterine life. So if we are skilled enough, knowledge enough, having the evidence-based knowledge 
and we are able to equip ourselves for practicing, I think we can save majority of these babies. We know that 90% of the babies doesn't need much of the help. They can survive the stress of the life and can transit smoothly to the extra uterine life. Whereas that out of the 10%, nine, nine of them will be uh, having uh, needed a, just a stimulation and drying and stimulation will help. Only 1% out of that needed advanced uh, resuscitation things. So for the learning objective, what is the neonatal asphyxia and its causes, its management, and specifically the nurse's role we'll be dealing with. So for an, uh, we say the asphyxia, what is that? It's a condition arising when the body is deprived of oxygen and uh, uh, leading to suffocation, unconsciousness, death. It could be because of the drowning, strangulation, or anything. So uh, the, with the uh, in context of the newborns, we often see that asphyxia neonatorum or the birth asphyxia or perinatal asphyxia, all these terms are the same. And this is preferred, to, the perinatal asphyxia is the preferred term to be used to birth asphyxia because asphyxia may occur before, during, or after birth also. So in uh, the newer textbooks, if you look at, you can see the perinatal asphyxia as a common term. So some of the pathological terms I would like to introduce here is anoxia. I know that everyone knows about it. Anoxia, just to reiterate, anoxia is a complete lack of oxygen. Hypoxia is a stage of decreased availability of oxygen. It could be of any reason. Hypoxemia is a decreased arterial concentration of oxygen. And ischemia, we know that insufficient blood flow to the cells or the organ resulting in death of the cell, like uh, uh, myocardial ischemia, we say often. So what is exactly the perinatal asphyxia leaf? It's a medical condition resulting from the deprivation of the oxygen to the newborn infant that causes physical harm. Mainly, we are more worried about the, I mean, the physical harm to the brain because of the lifelong disability it causes. So if you look at the definition, there is no specific or exact definition, complete definition for the neonatal or perinatal asphyxia as such. So uh, in uh, subject context, we can say that World Health Organization has defined the perinatal asphyxia as failure to initiate or sustain the breathing. Whereas in National Neonatal Perinatal Database Network, they define it as a moderate perinatal asphyxia as slow or gasping breathing or an APGAR score of four to six at one minute. And uh, they define severe perinatal asphyxia as no breathing or an APGAR score of zero to three at one minute of age. Whereas the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, they define with a specific criteria that uh, presence of the following criteria that are profound metabolic or mixed acidemia, that is the pH, will be less than seven in an umbilical uh, cord blood. Persistence of low APGAR score of less than uh, three in five minutes. And signs of neonatal neurological dysfunction in the form of seizures, encephalopathy, torn abnormalities, or evidence of multiple organ involvement, such as kidneys can be affected, lungs, liver, heart, and intestine. So if you look at the causes of it, we can say, the I mean, in the fetal life, the placenta perform the function of the respiration and placental insufficiency because of uh, the reasons like impairment of maternal oxygen could be the one that could, because of that, placenta cannot deliver oxygen to the fetus. So the impairment of maternal oxygen, that could be because of anemia in the mother or any other pulmonary uh, underlying cause or cardiac problem or neurological disease in the mother. So these all can impair the maternal oxygenation itself and that can lead to placental insufficiency. Or it could be decreased the flow from the mother to the placenta as uh, reiterating that placenta is the one function of the respiration, respiration in the fetal life. So if mother is having infection or uh, having shock or dehydration or even hypotension, there will be a decreased flow from the mother to the placenta. So that can lead to perinatal asphyxia. 
or it could be decreased flow from the placenta to the fetus because of the cord prolapse or a cord entanglement or true knot or cord compression it could be or placental abruption itself so all these can lead to decreased flow from the placenta to the feet so that again can cause urinary asphyxia or it could be impaired gas exchange across the placenta or at the fetal tissue level it could be because of the maternal hypertension vascular disease or placental uh, calcification in fact or fibrosis or in diabetes in one or drug abuse and uh, then or the involvement of fetal requirement or oxygen in more requirement because if the fetus itself having fetal anemia or in the uterine growth retardation there is a increased requirement of fetal oxygenation instead so these are all some of the causes that can risk for men the can cause the perinatal asphyxia so if you uh, say that the causes of perinatal asphyxia before birth as i said it can happen before during or after birth so before birth it could be mostly because of the inadequate oxygenation of the maternal blood or low maternal bp it could be so many reasons are there hypoventilation during the anesthesia cyanotic heart disease in the mother other respiratory failure acute blood loss spinal anesthesia itself can cause or great vessel compression by the gravity uterus when the mother is positioned in a supine position or uterine tetany because of the ox- oxytocin induced one or premature separation of the placenta so all these can causes perinatal because it can uh, hamper with the oxygenation of the fetus or it at the birth it could be because of the uh, fetal involvement like fetal cyanotic heart disease or uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia or severe pulmonary distress the uh, baby is having preterm or postterm baby or severe anemia or a shock because of any massive blood loss of the uh, in utero all this can lead to perinatal asphyxia so what is the pathophysiology of asphyxia as we know even if even for us also if it uh, be in a close our nose uh, not getting enough oxygen what will happen for a brief period we'll have fast breath the same way when an infant is deprived of oxygen because of the placental insufficiency or any other other uh, causes initial brief period of fast breathing can occur so if the same status uh, continues what happen the respiratory movement becomes shallow heart rate start begin to fall and muscle tone gradually diminishes and baby uh, the is going into apnea known as primary apnea or if this stay uh, status is continued or the asphyxia is continuing infant develop deep gasping respiration again heart rate continues to decrease bp start falling and nearly become flaccid and enters the a period of apnea called secondary apnea so we don't know in which stage or either in primary apnea or secondary apnea the baby is coming out from the uterus so for us we deal it as a secondary apnea and we start doing the resuscitation during the uh, resuscitation time so we know it's a, a perinatal asphyxia can uh, in i mean affect the multi organ dysfunction can happen because of that we are more worried for the cns because of the hypoxia ischemic encephalopathy which can lead to life long disability intracranial hemorrhage seizures long term neurological sequence can happen it can in, uh, also affect the i mean ischemic problem can happen to cardiac muscles it can lead to myocardial dysfunction valvular dysfunction congestive heart failure cardiac failure in renal uh, it affect as a, it will show as hematuria acute tubular necrosis renal vein thrombosis the pulmonary there will be delayed adaptation because we know that the lungs in utero the lungs are filled with uh, fluid and if the ventilation is not happening right at the beginning of the birth there can be problem with that because of the that can lead to delayed adaptation respiratory failure meconium <coughs> surfactant depletion primary pulmonary hypertension again. in gi tract necrotizing enterocolitis hepatic dysfunction and hematologically if you look at there could be thrombocytopenia or any coagulation abnormalities 
then definitely uh, ischemia persisting that can cause to acidosis, hypoglycemia, metabolic uh, dysfunction like hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hyponatremia, etc. So, as uh, you know, hypoxic damage to most of the organs, as it was been uh, explained in the last slide. Developmental delay, intellectual disability, spasticity, motor disease, and cerebral palsy are some of the effects of perinatal asphyxia. So, what are we going to do for this? How we can prevent it? As nurses, most of the we know that perinatal asphyxia are one of the leading cause of the uh, uh, neonatal mortality, and uh, out of uh, out of the three is uh, the prematurity and the sepsis. The perinatal asphyxia is the one of the three causes. And what is our role as nurses? Of course, the uh, uh, monitoring has to start from the antenatal period before the prenatal actually it should happen. I mean, the preparedness should start from that period itself. At least from the antenatal period, if the mother is going to the antenatal clinic and having the antenatal visit and the investigations happening, we can find out any other comorbidities the mother is having. So that can uh, we can uh, treat that. Or in the labor room, if it is not happening, and as we are in the posted in the labor room, what we can do? We can monitor the mother. Use of a simple uh, chart is called as partogram. So if you rigorously, uh, closely monitor using this partogram, we can see the progression of the labor, or is there any deviation where we have to take any stand for emergency cesarean, or if you are in a lower, I mean, center, whether you need to go, I mean, refer the mother, mother to higher center or not. So monitoring is very important. Then the next step is the preparedness. So when we know about the history of the mother, any antenatal history, like high risk mothers, like if any bad history, the obstetric history the mother is having, or it's, is it a multi-pregnancy or any other problem or RH uh, isoimmunization is there or not. So all these things, it's like high risk we know, or if any other comorbidity like mother is having a heart disease or diabetes. So or because of all this, we know, we have to prepare uh, prepare ourselves because it can, it could be going to be a high risk delivery. So for that, anticipation is very important, and we have to prepare accordingly. Uh, same like in a disaster management, we say anticipation, preparedness is very important because all, each birth is a medical emergency. So we have to be prepared for this and provide the care timely. So what are the preparation we have to do? So in, uh, in India, we know that in all the health centers, uh, in district hospital or in a uh, tertiary hospital, a primary health center, we have been provided with the newborn care corner. So the newborn care corner having a higher temperature because for the resuscitation of the newborn, we know it's a TABC. That is T stands for temperature airway, breathing, circulation, and drugs, it comes. So it's very important to maintain the temperature. If we are effectively doing the resuscitation and we are not taking care of the temperature, there is no use, I mean, the recovery of the baby will not be that effective as we have been expecting. So it's very important to have a radiant warmer. Then you should have uh, adequate equipment, like for the resuscitation, we need an ambu bag, with the face mask of different sizes and uh, suction machine. If you don't have a suction machine or if you are in a where, um, area where you don't have electricity, at least you should have a mucus extractor with you and you should have a pair of clothes for uh, drying the baby and uh, draping the baby. Then oxygen supply should be there, either central supply or the oxygen cylinder with the flow meter the nasal suction catheters and laryngoscope with different sizes of blade because we don't know whether it's a preterm baby or a term baby. So you should have separate uh, different sizes of the laryngoscope blade, zero, one, double zero for extremely preterm babies we use, and endotracheal tubes of different sizes like 2.5, 3, 3.5. 
because we know that difference is the less than one kilo baby we use 2.5 id mm uh, size of the et tube and for one to two kg we use 3 mm et tube et uh, 3 mm size et tube and for uh, two to three 3.5 and more more than three we use four size like that it goes so all these things we have to have it's not that only we are keeping it we have to check this functionality also that is very important so for before each delivery you should see that all the equipments are functioning properly and you have everything in your hand and weighing scale and injection regimen also has to be kept so um, if you know that it's uh, delivery is going to happen before that you have to uh, put on the radiant warmer so that the temperature can be maintained so this way preparation has to have then coming to the resuscitation the new new revised uh, in uh, newborn resuscitation guideline so before that the preparedness itself we should have a team meeting for that so assess the risk factors we have to ask ourselves about the uh, how the mother's condition is then we should, uh, it's always a team team approach so we should have a pediatrician or the one who is skilled enough to do the advanced uh, uh, resuscitation and uh, supporters also we need to sit team so if it's a twin uh, delivery is expecting you should have a two a group sets of people for that so the team briefing has to happen and allocate the task for each person who is in the team for what to do when to do all this and equipment check and counseling on the parents is also important so this is the preparedness part we do then the, as the birth starts we start the timer and we have to ask is the baby crying or breathing so if the baby is crying so what is happening then so the routine care this is the new uh, the re revised the guidelines or you know, the change in the uh, previous practice which is being practiced now since 2000 i mean a uh, baby is put on the uh, mother's abdomen dry the baby suction is, or position the baby or turn the baby to the side line and suction only if required and cut the cord after one minute that's a delayed cord clamping and check the breathing color initiate the breastfeeding and we'll allow the baby to be there in the uh, with the mother for at least minimum one hour that is a skin to skin care at birth so this is a newer practice which has to be followed so if the baby is not breathing then and uh, uh, i must say that this is one situation where we expect some person to cry so that it brings happiness to others isn't it it is a irony of the life everywhere we try to smile get, give smile to others there are here in the de delivery room we expect the person to cry so that we become happy so if the baby is not breathing or crying then what has to be done we have to cut the cord immediately and we have to take the baby under the radiant warmer which has been put on beforehand and we have to position to open the airway and suction only if required and then we dry and stimulate the baby and then reposition the baby so pay, uh, mean if the baby is in the primary apnea most of the time that is the initial steps which you do uh, the baby will respond to it and uh, we have to assess uh, afterwards to see that whether baby is gasping or apnea or heart rate is more than 100 beats per minute so if it is uh, heart rate is 100 uh, beats per minute or uh, gasping is there nothing is there I mean the baby started breathing then we have to assess the breathing pattern is it levered breathing or a persistent cyanosis is there so if there is no persistent cyanosis or not not having any levered breath the routine of the baby will be shifted back to mother subdermal practice skin to skin care and then initiate breastfeeding and the allow the baby to be with the mother so this is one thing or if it's a levered breathing persisting cyanosis then we can think of giving supplementary oxygen or even initiating the cpr so the other situation is it's a minute within one minute we have to that's the golden minute we say so we what did you do do 
the baby was crying so we are given only the routine care and uh, baby was not crying so we cut the cord placed under warmer to take care of the temperature airway open then the uh, position and given stimulation and we assessed it and uh, the baby was not breathing and the heart rate or it could be uh, heart rate is less than 100 per minute then we have to initiate the positive pressure ventilation using room air so this is a change which is happening and we have we have a targeted saturation uh, to be maintained because we don't expect that one minute to have 100% uh, saturation for the baby so 60 to 65% at one minute of time is acceptable targeted saturation for the baby so that with golden minute we have to initiate that positive pressure ventilation or we should establish breathing so that is a golden minute we say and uh, initiating the uh, positive pressure ventilation we have to see the, after five inflation whether the heart rate is in because if it's a effective ventilation we know the first sign to improve is the heart rate will increase so if the heart rate is not improving that means your your uh, positive pressure ventilation is not effective so we have to check for look for the check uh, chest rise and if not we have to take the corrective steps what are the corrective steps for the pneumonic everyone will be knowing mr soap reapply the mask reposition suctioning in case if there any secretions are there <clears throat> then uh, positive pressure ventilation with more pressure you have to give or uh, because in extreme preterm babies are not the when we apply the mask the mouth tend to close so we have to give the uh, provide positive pressure ventilation with mouth open and if any skilled person this is time we can think of doing the intubation also so this is what we have to so the changes which happening here is skin to skin delayed cord clamping and allowing uh, i mean uh, initiating the pre positive pressure ventilation without uh, i mean for the preterm there is a difference for term baby we can use room air for a preterm babies we uh, I mean less than 32 weeks we uh, uh, give oxygen of 21 to 30% of oxygen we can start for the positive pressure ventilation and we prefer to use tp resuscitator rather, rather than um, bag and mask for preterm baby so for the for, uh, giving the positive pressure ventilation so one within golden minute if we could uh, establish the breathing we are happy so, so we are uh, ventilated that is the main purpose of the resuscitation in newborn so if the baby is not breathing i mean they are not improved we have to give the effective positive pressure ventilation for 30 seconds each after each 30 seconds we have to assess isn't it so after that effective positive pressure ventilation that is the heart i mean the chest rise was there and when if the chest rise was not there you have done the corrective measures and we in i mean continue the positive pressure ventilation for 30 seconds then we assess the baby uh, first uh, we have to check the heart rate and the respiration the baby started breathing well and the heart rate has improved more than 100 per, per minute so what we have to do and if the positive pressure ventilation for, was less than 1 minute baby goes to the observational care we place the baby on the mother's chest cover the baby and mother together monitor breathing heart rate check the temperature and we can initiate the breastfeeding but we have to be still more cautious than the routine care we have to observe even for uh, routine care babies also for 1 hour uh, uh, at a interval of 15 minutes we have to monitor the baby for the respiration heart rate color so here uh, after positive pressure ventilation of 30 second effective uh, ventilation uh, for 30 seconds we assess the baby and uh, if the baby's heart rate was 60 to 100 bed and chest to us rising we'll continue with the uh, positive pressure ventilation <laughs> and uh, if the heart rate is less than 60 per minutes and chest is rising so what steps we do here if the heart rate is less than 60 we have to so we have to take care of the circulation also here 
we start doing the chest compression that is at the rate of three compression with one uh, breath. Intubate, continue positive pressure ventilation and we can uh, give 100% oxygen over here. And uh, after this 30 seconds of uh, continuing the positive pressure ventilation, if the baby was not breathing, but the heart rate was between 60 to 100 breath, breath per minute, continued 30 seconds of uh, positive pressure ventilation. After, uh, after that, when we assess the baby's heart rate was increased and baby started breathing, baby will go for the postnatal care. And here, check the temperature and we'll leave debrief and counsel the parents about the sequences of what happened and uh, stabilize the baby over here. And uh, when the heart rate was less than 60, but we are doing the, continuing with the PPV, we started to add on to that is the chest compression also. And after that, again, if the heart rate is less than 60 breath per minute, we, uh, um, beats per minute, we have to add the drugs. The drug of choice over here is IV epinephrine, that is in one, one in 10,000 ratio we give. And then we have to think of other conditions also. So here, uh, as uh, this is the another change of, uh, here we have to do for that, we have to go for the targeted preductal saturation at birth. So we don't have to be so much worried about uh, 100 percent of saturation for the baby. So we know that by 10 minutes only we expect the babies to have 85 to 90 percent of saturation. And that also the preductal. Preductal because that means the nurses has to place the uh, saturation probe on the right hand of the baby. So why that preductal is there? Because we know that it's a uh, uh, the preductal, as the name implies, this is a, uh, the supply to the right heart, uh, hand is from the uh, branch of aorta, which is pre to the ductal, ductal arteriosus. So then coming to the Abgar scoring. Once the baby, I mean, the Abgar scoring is something which uh, has been uh, developed by Virginia Abgar, that is a, who was an anesthetist in Colombo University in, way back 1953. So there are some five criteria are there and we give a value of zero, one, and two. And it's recorded at one and five minutes after the birth. So like if I say that uh, at, uh, at one minute of time, the heart rate was 70 or 80 per minute and there was no activity or no reflex re reaction and the color was blue and there was some slow gas slow or gasping breaths are there. So the one minute up bar will come as, it, um, the baby had slow gasping, though I have to score as one. Then heart rate was 80, that means less than 100, so I'll give one. Then there was no uh, reflex or any, no activity was there and color was blue. So that will score only the zeros. So the total score was two at one minute. So this way we have to uh, score the total scoring has to be done. So a score of seven to 10 is considered as a good one. A score of four to six is moderately abnormal that need some support to the baby. And a score of zero to three is very low in full term and a late preterm infant. So if at five minutes, even when an infant has a score of less than seven, According to the neonatal resuscitation program guidelines, it recommends to continue the recording of at five minutes interval up to 20 minutes. So uh, there are some uh, limitations for the Abgar scoring. It's purely a subjective criteria and individual to individual, individual it can differ. And it's not validated in preterm and very low birth weight because we know the tone and the uh, Grim, uh, reflection, reflexes will be different in a term and a preterm way. And mother under sedation or not, uh, narcotics, we know that the babies will be born, uh, I mean, uh, will be having problems in initiating the breath sometime, I mean, uh, because of that, or congenital malformation can affect the score. 
and it does not help in resuscitation because it, we are not taking it as a guideline for starting the resuscitation. You have to remember this. This is just to monitor the uh, status of the cardiorespiratory uh, respiration at the time of birth, as well as we can monitor the responses of the uh, resuscitation at the intervals. This is not for using it as a guideline for starting the resuscitation. We have to remember this. There is no correlation with long-term outcome using this UPCAR score. But again, it's conventionally used every day in our day-to-day -day practice. So we have survived the baby. We have given effective uh, resuscitation. And what we have to do? We have seen the routine care. The baby will be with the mother. And uh, less than one minute, again, the observational care and will be with the mother. And uh, if the baby needed prolonged bag and mask ventilation of more than 61 minutes, or if this UBGAR score was 0 to 3 at 1 minute, or the, the baby was requiring chest compression, needs to be transferred to the NIC. And other babies who have been transferred to the mother should be monitored frequently uh, for. Uh, 48 hours for the development of any feature suggestive of the hypoxic ischemic that We have to remember this. So what exactly happens? When the hypoxia, that is uh, oxygen deprivation is there, so there is a diving zeal reflex is there. That means that's a nature's protection for the vital organ exactly. So what is happening? Peripheral constriction and all the blood is going uh, I mean, divided into the your uh, shunting of blood to the brain, adrenal, and the heart. And uh, it will be reduced for the lungs, kidneys, and the guts. So, they, uh, in the, uh, they, because that will save the brain organ injury, the diving seal reflex. But if the asphyxia continues, there is no, I mean, uh, measures we have taken care for reduce, I mean, the stabilizing the baby or providing oxygen. So shunting within the brain also, okay, because we know the brain is supplied with a circular relay that uh, art supply, uh, blood circulation. So the anterior circulation will suffer. That is given, um, that is the one which is supplying to the cerebral cortex, cortical lesion. And the posterior circulation will be maintained. That is also, again, as I said, it's a nature's uh, uh, safety measure. We can see. So this is uh, so this is what it happens. So we can say it's last like stages of brain injury in hypoxic is if the hypoxia is uh, I mean sustaining that can lead to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. What is happening in that? Because of the primary neuronal injury, because of the brain infarction is happening, that is interruption of oxygen and blood glucose to the brain. So that will lead to decrease in the adenotriphosphate and results in failure of ATP-dependent sodium-potassium pump. Sodium enters the cell, intracellular material, uh, which go to the intracellular, followed by water, causing what happened? Cell edema. And there is a depolarization because of the movement of sodium and potassium from the intracellular to the extracellular compartment and can lead to eventually to the cell death. So cell death and lysis causes release of glutamate, that is an excitatory amino acid, which causes increase in the intracellular calcium for the cell damage. So after that, the primary injury, there's a latent period of about six hours is there. So that is what even we, we know that when even in a cerebral vascular injury, we say that the treatment has to be provided like stroke and all. We say within that uh, golden window period, that the six hours, we have to initiate the treatment. Otherwise, there is no use. The same way here, within the six hours, any specific treatment has to happen, has to be given to protect the brain from further injury. So the late secondary neuronal injury occurs over the next 24 to 48 hours because of the reperfusion to that affected area, results in blood flow to and from damaged area that spreads the neurotransmitters and widening the area of the brain affected. That is what it happens. <laughs> so the hypoxic ischemia leads to primary neuronal death, 
then cytotoxic mechanism that uh, sodium potassium pump uh, reaction atp depletion and delayed neuronal death and consequent death so there are different uh, uh, staging or you can say monitoring we can uh, use for that livings and thomsons uh, <clears throat> uh, for uh, assessing the condition the comos commonly be uses are not sarna scoring is used and stage 1 stage 2 and stage 3 so in a neonate may be hyper alert with prolonged period of wakefulness midriasis and increased deep reflex tender reflex will be reflected in stage 1 in stage 2 it could be with the maybe more lethargy decreased in tone strong distal and generalized parasympathetic tone pupillary reaction will be constriction bradycardia and increased secretions and seizures will be happening stage 2 stage 3 again further decreased level of consciousness flaccid tone decreased deep tender reflex and very abnormal eeg stage there are different stages so you can say the clinical features will uh, a uh, decrease i mean uh, the severity will increase as the time passes like birth to 12 hours there will decreased alertness and tone convulsions can happen periodic breathing or respiratory failure can happen because of the multi organ involvement and intact pupillary and ocular motor responses 12 to 24 hours there will change in alertness level apneic spells increase in the convulsions so jitters we have to differentiate between that weakness in the proximal limb then so this so close monitoring to, throughout this time should be there so we know that once we have shifted the baby into the nic and uh, we have some specific management that is coming up now in developed country it's been provided whereas in india we don't have in every centers with uh, this therapeutic hypothermia intervention but in our unit we have so what we do is there are inclusion criteria for this so it, the inclusion criteria is that the gestation should be 35 weeks um, uh, more than 35 weeks of gestation or if your gestation is not aware the baby's weight should be more than 2 kg and uh, within 6 hours of since birth it has to be given and evidence of birth as fix here uh, like uh, the abgas scoring is uh, persistently low within the 5 minutes or you have uh, the uh, metabolic acidosis is there and your uh, cord blood uh, ph is less than 7 or the basic ph is more than 16 millimol per liter so all these criteria and any uh, uh, ischemic changes or the hypo hi is uh, present like a convulsion or hypotonia is there so these are the criteria for inclusion for the hypothermia so in that what is happening is we have a blanket role used for that for providing the temperature is will reduce to 30 33.5 degrees celsius within the 4 4 to 6 hours and continued for 72 hours so we have to do the cooling for 72 hours after 72 hours of initiating the cooling slow rewarming of the infant for temperature by 0.5 degree celsius every hour until 36.5 degree celsius uh, will do and will stabilize with that so this is the therapeutic hypothermia but we the all the i mean the specific management also comes with the uh, pro, contra indications are also there like if the baby is having major congenital malformation so uh, any clinical or echocardiographic evidence of ppsn that is persistent pulmonary hypotension so these are contra indication so the side effect of uh, therapeutic hypothermia is uh, uh, sinus bradycardia and thrombocytopenia and other supportive management for irrespective of that you have to maintain the normal temperature that is very sure avoid hypothermia because we know that when the temperature is increase the metabolism will increase and that can lead to more chemical release in the cerebrum so then maintain the normal oxygenation and ventilation we have to assess the infant for adequate ventilation if the respiratory support is needed we have to ventilate 
you are intubate the baby and we have to provide support accordingly and we have to maintain the normal tissue perfusion so we can see by the capillary refilling time is there we have to maintain that normal perfusion less than 3 a second has to be maintained so otherwise we have to give uh, fluid volume i mean volume expanders must be needed or we have to start with the intravenous fluid for the, all the babies with apcas for of less than 4 at 1 minute and maintain normal hematocrit and your pcv should be up to 50 45 to 55% and you have to check the blood glucose in between and nutrition status we have to start only once the baby has the hemodynamically stable status otherwise we have to provide with the uh, iv fluid so in uh, ventilated babies we know that so much of uh, connections are there we have to take care of each and everything et tube your og tube your urinary output your temperature close monitoring has to be done so i am not going into detail of this So we know that. So, so take home messages for today is the commonest cause of cardiorespiratory arrest is the respiratory origin for the newborn, and the primary focus of the neonatal resuscitation is to establish the effective ventilation. So that you have to remember. We know that the lungs in fetuses is filled with fluid. So by giving uh, effective ventilation, we can fill the alveoli and the distal. Uh, alveoli with the air, and if the newborn is hypothermic, response to resuscitative effects are very suboptimal. So always the sequence of resuscitation in newborn is T A B C. Always remember this. And each birth must be considered as a medical emergency, and effective management need to anticipate adequately equipped with functional equipment. You should have a standard protocol. then availability of the skilled the healthcare professionals is also important because always if a delivery is there one person dedicatedly for taking care of the baby has to be there in that delivery room and birth asphyxia is not an uncommon event because of the high mortality and morbidity condition which we men best managed by the interprofessional team so it's always a team approach so always uh, take keep in it in mind that the changes which we have talked about is like uh, delayed cord clamping and uh, routine care skin to skin care and uh, targeted oxygen we have to think of and accordingly only we'll add on to the oxygen supply and we prefer to use t pieces rather than ambu bag for specially preterm babies and for preterm baby less than 32 or less than 1 kg baby we need to give extra cover like use of polythene cover for taking care of the temperature so these are some of the changes which is recently happened and one more thing for the meconium as uh, uh, stained like uh, the previously we used to say we have to see that whether the tracheal uh, suction has to be done before the head delivery that is uh, now it's not practice and there was the term use vigorous and non vigorous now it's so that is also not considered we take the baby as the same as the other babies only and we do accordingly we'll see whether the baby is crying or not crying and accordingly we have to uh, do the resuscitation so these are the some of the newer changes thank you for the patient hearing any query you can thank you ma'am Uh, for quick reviewing about the neonatal asphyxia there are few questions from the participants uh, so uh, one of the one of our participant asked how asphyxia will lead to meconium aspiration you know uh, the vagal reflexes is even for us also if we if any person with the uh, strangulating suicidal attempt and or you know what are the things to happen the same way that the reflex which can lead to the meconium can be passed in that uh, in utero when the baby is asphyxiated that can lead to so the distress which the baby is have yeah uh, then uh, mom other question is what is size of laryngoscope and et tube we are using in neonates so that i said it's uh, neonatal blades we have different sizes like double zero the smaller size and straight blade is will be and uh, zero double zero for extremely preterm then zero size and one 
So if you look, when you come to the unit really you can identify so the size of the difference, you can see it. And uh, ET tube, as I said, 2.5, 3, 3.5, that is uh, used for less than one kg, 2.5 uh, mm of uh, ID, the internal diameter ET tube we use. And for one to two kg, three size, and three, two to three is 3.5, like that. Is that clear? Yes, ma'am, it was clear. Ma'am, another question is, once baby is delivered and the baby is not crying and weak, then also we should go for delayed cord clamping? No, I said, uh, if you remember, recall that uh, guideline which I said, if the baby is not crying, we are uh, cutting the uh, cord and we are taking the baby to the warmer for uh, further management. That means if the baby is hemodynamically not stable, we should go for uh, further yeah. management, not for yeah. delayed cord clamping. Hmm. And another question is, can we practice delayed cord clamping in all babies, like term baby, preterm babies, and post-term yeah. babies? Yes, yes. Yeah, so it's only depending upon the hemodynamic status of the baby. If it yes. is stable, we can practice the delayed cord clamping. Yes. And ma'am, another question is, is it mandatory to provide skin-to-skin -skin contact right after the birth? So, you know, that is, uh, that the initial period is a wakeful period for the baby. And uh, the, so much of stress, both the mother and the baby. And if the baby is with the mother, mother also will, uh, will be relaxed. And that is where the time where if you initiate bre uh, breast milking and all the lactation management also will be helpful. I mean, will be much better if you provide with the skin to skin care. And temperature also will be taken care by providing skin to skin care during the time. Yeah, there's one more last question is there. Why temperature comes first in neonatal resuscitation? Because you know, if the if any drop in temper one degree of uh, drop in temperature can lead to approximately around 28% of mortality rate. So the uh, that is why the temperature has to be taken care of much better because if you don't take care of the temperature, all the calorie will be burned for keeping the baby uh, in the hyper, I mean, normothermic temperature. So we, we need to have that all the system has to function. So for that, we need to have a normothermic. Yeah. Yeah, ma'am, uh, that much only. There is no more queries and uh, chat box. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for highlighting all the aspects of neonatal asphyxia. So uh, before moving on to the next session, I have a few instructions for the participants. The post test link will be shared in the comment box at the end of all the sessions. The link will be active till 1st of May. You can attempt and you should score 23 out of 30 to get the certificate. If you didn't score that much score in the first attempt, you can again go through the video and re-attempt uh, re -attempt the post test link. And once you successfully complete the post test, you will get the certificate within two weeks. And our next webinar is on 24th of April. So I'm moving to the second scientific session. So in second session, we are going to discuss about pathological neonatal jaundice. We have Ms. Anuma, who is working as nursing officer at Ames, New Delhi. She did her master's in pediatric nursing and has more than seven years of experience in the area of nursing. I welcome Anuma on behalf of ISCCN and welcome you and ask you to continue with your session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Ambri, uh, for the introduction. Let me share the screen. Is it visible? Uh, it's can visible. You, you can go for the slideshow mode. It's visible. Yeah, now it is correct. You can go ahead. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today, uh, we will be talking about pathological jaundice, which is a common condition among newborns 
jaundice if you see during our student period or during our practice time also we could have seen that jaundice is one of the common uh, condition which we see among newborns in neonatal icu or whether it is in adenatal uh, postnatal ward uh, so so today we will discuss on uh, pathological jaundice so uh, we will be seeing about metabolism of bilirubin uh, difference between physiological and pathological jaundice causes of pathological jaundice, clinical features of pathological jaundice, investigations and management, and final role of nurse in uh, management. So, uh, uh, what is jaundice? Jaundice is the yellowish discoloration of the skin, sclera, and mucous membrane resulting from buildup of bilirubin. That is, because of hyperbilirubinemia, there will be yellowish discoloration of the skin, sclera, and mucous membrane that is known as jaundice. If you say 60% of term newborns and 80% of preterm newborns develop jaundice in the first week of life. So, uh, um, uh, this is a uh, or average percentage of newborns getting affected with jaundice. So, there is a reason uh, why, uh, because of which newborns have, uh, newborns are presented with jaundice very commonly. But to understand that, we should understand the metabolism of bilirubin. So, uh, how is this bil uh, bilirubin produced or how this metabolism occurs in our body? So, we see in the reticular endothelial system, the RBCs are, uh, RBCs break down to produce biliverdin, with, which further gets converted to bilirubin uh, by bil biliverdin reductase enzyme. And this bilirubin form from biliverdin is unconjugated form of bilirubin. Unconjugated form is it's insoluble in water. So this insoluble uh, bilirubin, it is a circulator, circulate, uh, it is present in the circulation in a complex form. That is, it binds with albumin and this is how it circulates in the blood of uh, newborn or uh, uh, humans. So once, because as it is binded with uh, albumin, as it forms a complex, it, it, it protects uh, some of the major organs like uh, brain uh, from staining of uh, this bilirubin and further brain damages. So, if you see, again, this uh, bilirubin albumin complex, it will move into the liver and where it gets uh, dissociated and this bilirubin is converted to conjugated bilirubin. This, uh, the bilirubin which uh, gets transferred to liver is in unconjugated form. This gets converted into conjugated bilirubin with the help of glucuronyl transferase enzyme. And uh, further, this conjugated bilirubin is excreted along with bile into the in, in the GI tract of the baby where the normal flora or the bacteria that is present in the gut of the baby will act upon this conjugated bilirubin and converts it into urobilinogen or stercobilinogen which is, which is uh, excreted through urine or stool and uh, uh, so this is the normal metabolism of bilirubin. So why is, uh, how does this results in an increased level of bilirubin in uh, newborns. If you see, there are certain alterations in this metabolism in newborn. The first one is, we said that, uh, I said that uh, bilirubin is produced by the breakdown of RBCs. So if you see, uh, the lifespan of RBC in uh, newborn is of shorter period. That is one cause, that is increased hemolysis takes place in newborn. And another thing is, uh, another condition is baby presented with RH isomerization and ABO incompatibility. Uh, these are the conditions which, where uh, mother's blood group and baby's blood group will be incompatible and further babe, mother's blood, blood group will produce antibodies against the baby's blood group and it will result in the hemolysis of the baby's blood group. So further it, uh, it results in hemolysis, further hemolysis results in increased production of bilirubin. Another thing is G6PD deficiency, uh, a deficiency of an enzyme which results in uh, hemolysis and uh, certain other conditions like uh, cephalhematoma and some bruises which is present on the baby's body uh, which results in hemolysis. Because of all these conditions, hemolysis, rate of hemolysis will be more and further it results in hyperbilirubinemia in babies. And another condition is immature liver of the baby. Because of the immature uh, liver of the baby and lack of certain enzymes like uh, glucuronate transferase which uh, uh, further babies will, the conjugation of this unconjugated bilirubin to conjugated bilirubin may not be taking place adequately. So this also can re result in increased level of unconjugated bilirubin in the blood of the baby. And another uh, physiology is uh, 
as a new body is born the intestinal uh, intestinal uh, flora the colonization may not be adequate further i said that in this gi tract conjugated bilirubin is deconjugated by the action of this normal flora present, present in our gi tract so most of uh, as the new body is born colonization of this normal flora must not have taken place that much in a uh, greater amounts further this can decrease the deconjugation of bilirubin so these are the certain alterations or changes in this metabolism of bilirubin which leads to the hyperbilirubinemia in baby first one is increased hemolysis second is immature liver and third one is decreased colonization and uh, other than that lack of certain enzymes all these can lead to uh, increased bilirubin level in baby's blood so uh, we commonly say that there are uh, two two types of jaundice physiological and pathological jaundice uh, let's see the difference between these two uh, if it is physiological jaundice we can say that develops only after the second or third day in term babies and after third or fourth day preterm newborn whereas it develops within 24 hours of life with, uh, whereas pathological jaundice develops within 24 hours of life that is there should be, there will be an underlying uh, underlying pathology for the cause of this hyperbilirubinemia Physiological jaundice usually disappears by seventh day in term newborns and by ninth or tenth day in preterm newborn. Uh, pathological jaundice may persist for longer time. In physiological jaundice, serum bilirubin level may be comparatively less as that of pathological jaundice. Uh, in pathological jaundice, usually bilirubin levels are of much higher levels. And uh, in physiological jaundice, daily serum bilirubin level will be less than 5 mg per dl. Whereas in pathological jaundice, serum bilirubin level rise per day may be more than 5 mg per dl. In physiological jaundice, connectors is not pre present. Connectors is the brain damage or um, resulting from this high bilirubin level. Uh, in pathological jaundice can lead to connectors. In physiological jaundice, the newborn is usually healthy with normal color of stools and urine. Whereas in pathological jaundice, usually the newborn may be sick, pale, uh, poor feeding will be there. Any, uh, the, we can notice abnormal color of urine and stool and uh, in physiological jaundice treatment is usually not required uh, whereas in pathological jaundice immediate and emergency management is required so if you see uh, physiological jaundice is not that dangerous for babies whereas pathological is an emergency condition which needs immediate management so let's see some causes of this pathological jaundice so we have seen the metabolism of the bilirubin that there is bilirubin production, conjugation, transport and excretion. So any interference in this path can lead to pathological jaundice. First is excessive destruction of RBCs. Certain causes of excessive destruction of RBCs are, I have already said that incompatibilities in the, incompatibilities in the blood group of baby and the mother. For example, recess uh, incompatibilities. If the mother's blood group is negative and the baby's blood group is positive, Mother's blood group, mother's bl blood will uh, produce antibodies against the baby's blood, which will result in the hemolysis of the ba baby's blood. And uh, similar is the ABO incompatibility. When mother's blood is O and the baby's blood is A or B, it can result in uh, hemolysis of the baby's blood group, baby's blood, RBCs. Another thing is increased, increased blood cell fragility, uh, like uh, congenital spirocytosis. Is a condition uh, which affects the cell membrane of the RBCs, which results in increased hemolysis, increased destruction of RBCs. So, increase, naturally, increased destruction of RBCs will result in increased bilirubin level. Next is deficient red cell enzyme causing hemolytic anemia, G6PD deficiency. G6PD deficiency is, uh, is, uh, it is a genetic disorder uh, and inborn of metabolism where the enzyme uh, deficiency of this G6PD enzyme can result in uh, can result in hemolysis. Another is neonatal sepsis, uh, uh, which uh, results in hemolysis and extra of blood such as cephalometoma and IVH. Another is polycythemia and thalassemia. All these are the conditions that result in increased uh, destruction of RBCs, resulting resulting in hyperbilirubinemia. Another is defective conjugation or decreased clearance. So defective production of enzyme glucuronyl transferase we have seen in the metabolism that the enzyme glucuronyl transferase is the enzyme that helps in conjugation of the unconjugated bilirubin so defi de deficiency of this enzyme dehydration starvation and hypoxia and uh, krigler najar syndrome gilbert syndrome these are the uh, two syndromes that is related to glucuronyl transferase enzyme 
and another is metabolic disorders hypothyroidism and galactosemia hypothyroidism is a preventable condition uh, which results in uh, hyperbilirubinemia and a low pl plasma albumin level also can result in uh, increased bilirubin level in the metabolism we have seen that the circulatory bilirubin is always in a complex form that is unconjugated bilirubin is always present in the circulation binded to albumin if, the, uh, if there is a lack of albumin level unconjugated bilirubin level will increase in the blood and it can affect many vital organs like blood, uh, like brain and so, certain other miscellaneous causes are biliary atresia bile plug absence of common bile duct intestinal obstruction so in the uh, as we have discussed in the metabolism of bilirubin uh, the bilirubin is uh, excreted through the along with bile into the gi tract and further as uh, further this is excreted as urobilinogen and stercobilinogen in urine or in stool so any uh, hindrance in the pathway of this excretion can result in increased bilirubin level so these are the certain causes next we will see clinical features the main clinical features is uh, features are yellow discoloration of the skin sclera and mucous membrane baby may be irritable poor sucking will be there if you see breast, uh, if the baby is breastfed the baby may not be uh, sucking the breast uh, adequately or if the baby is uh, spoon fed the also baby may not be able to uh, suck the uh, uh, milk ad, uh, in a proper manner and baby will be lethargic stool may be clay or white colored urine staining the clothes or diaper yellow rapid rise in bilirubin level these are the certain clinical features so how can we assess uh, the yellowing or the jaundice in baby in a physical examination so the modified Kramer's rule uh, Kramer scale can be used for that if you see in this picture we can see that different grades are given for different body parts of the baby if it is for phase we grade it as one and the level of bilirubin may be four to six mg per dl that is if the jaundice is visible only in the face then we can say that the bilirubin level may be four to six mg per dl if it is on chest and upper abdomen we grade it as two and the level of bilirubin may be eight to ten mg per dl for lower abdomen and thighs 12 to 14 mg per dl arms and low, uh, lower legs 15 to 18 mg per dl and palms and soles 15 to 20 mg per dl so from this we can say that if the baby's palms and soles are ictory uh, then we can say that the baby is in a danger danger state so baby needs immediate management for hyperbilirubinemia that is but at the same time this modified Kramer's rule is not so reliable we need to confirm it with laboratory test uh, the investigations done are biochemical tests like high performance liquid chromatography this is a gold standard for total uh, serum bilirubin estimation and another thing is TSB done in labs based on the Vandenberg reaction and uh, the micro method for bilirubin estimation this is being practiced in our unit based on the uh, spectro photometry requires micro blood sample useful in neonates and preterm babies uh, because they usually the blood sample is collected in uh, uh, capillaries that is a mi minimum amount of blood is needed for this uh, estimation of bilirubin and another, th another thing is blood type and combs test to be done if mother's blood uh, is rh negative or o group uh, to rule out uh, rh incompatibility or abo incompatibility then cbc should be done and smear for hemolysis and rbc morphology reticulocyte count and g6pd estimation should be can be done repeat TSB 4 to 24 hours based on the gestation or age of the baby. The NICO protocol is like repeat TSB within 4 to 6 hours if initial TSB was in or near exchange cutoff. That is, uh, if the initial TSB level was within the ex, uh, exchange cutoff, that is for double volume exchange, then we have to repeat the TSB within 4 to 6 hours. In RSI summarization, repeat TSB at 8 to 12 hour interval for the first 48 hours and 12 to 24 hours later when probability of rise in TSB is not there. That is, initially when there is a rapid rise, we should test uh, the TSB level frequently. Later when there is a control, we can gradually decrease the frequency of test. So all these were invasive methods. This is, uh, the, uh, these two are two non-invasive methods that can be used. Transcutaneous bilirubinometer and ictrogram. So this uh, transcutaneous bilirubinometer is an equipment or a machine which helps uh, to check the bilirubin level just by placing the equipment over the skin of the baby either on forehead or on the sternum. 
how this is done is we check three consecutive times and the machine will display the average value of the bill ruby. This uh, TCB meter is um, used in um, our unit for uh, babies more than 35 weeks of uh, gestation. And uh, this is another thing, ictrogram. Uh, this, uh, this has different color codings uh, based on the level of ictrus and based on that we can estimate the bilirubin level in baby's blood. Next we will see the management. Management is predominantly phototherapy, pharmacological therapy and exchange transfusion. We will see one by one. First is phototherapy. Uh, if you see in phototherapy, a bilirubin uh, absorbs only the blue-green spectrum of the light. So, uh, blue-green spectrum is the most absorbed by bilirubin and the wavelength is uh, 460 to 490 nanometer. And the irradiance, irradiance if you see the dosage of phototherapy, we can say in simple language, dosage of phototherapy, for an effective phototherapy, it should be between 15 to 40 microwatt per centimeter square per nanometer of the baby's body surface area. And in intensive phototherapy, we should provide 30 microwatts per centimeter square per nanometer. The distance that should be maintained, we usually say that 30 to 40, it should be less than 40. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay. Um, so the distance, um, it, um, minimum of 15 centimeter we can keep in intensive, uh, intensive phototherapy. At the same time, we can follow the manufacturer's uh, instructions while keep maintaining the distance between the phototherapy unit and the baby. There are three main principles in uh, phototherapy. First one is photoisomerization, second is structural isomerization and third is photo oxidation. In photo isomerization, the uh, bilirubin is converted into uh, uh, water soluble isomers. But this is a reversible uh, process, whereas in structural isomerization, it is an irreversible process where bilirubin is converted into lumirubin, which is a water soluble state, which uh, further gets excreted in bile and is and is again uh, further excreted through urine or stool. And the last one is oxidation, photo oxidation, where the bilirubin absorbs the light, blue green uh, spectrum of light, uh, bilirubin will absorb that and the bilirubin will uh, react with oxygen to produce certain colorless products which is excreted through urine, uh, bile, urine and stool. So these are the three main principles of phototherapy. Photoisomerization, structural isomerization and photo oxidation. Intensive phototherapy in hemolytic or rapidly rising jaundice that is um, especially in RH uh, isomerization and ABU incompatibility we provide intensive phototherapy. We, we can use a billy blanket, additional overhead phototherapy units and distance of 15 to 20 centimeter uh, should be maintained uh, between the baby and the phototherapy unit and the irradiance uh, should be 30 microwatts per centimeter square per nanometer in intensive phototherapy. So how to check this irradiance? I have said that uh, irradiance is uh, in simple language is a dosage of phototherapy, how much we give. So this is an equipment which helps in testing the um, radiance of phototherapy. This is known as flux meter or radiometer. Uh, if you see in this picture, you can see that we will place this over the baby's body and this machine will uh, display the irradiance of the phototherapy unit which we are using. Based on this, we can either change the phototherapy unit or we can change the uh, tubes of the phototherapy unit so that the baby will get effective phototherapy. So the complications of phototherapy, there are short term side effects and long term side effects. Short term side effects include imbalance of thermal environment that is if the, uh, if the light is kept too close to the baby, baby may have hyperthermia. At the same time if it is kept too far and a baby may have hypothermia also if, the, if there is no warmer provided and the dehydration will be there, insensible water loss will be there leading to electrolyte imbalance and bronze baby syndrome uh, that is colored, uh, color, uh, the baby's color, skin color will change to dark gray, brown. This usually happens when we provide phototherapy in conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And baby will have loose stool, skin rashes, interference with maternal infant interaction 
if at all baby is getting intensive phototherapy baby may not be uh, phototherapy will be continuously given to the baby so the in interaction or bonding between the mother and baby can be affected and the long term side effects are skin cancer melanocytic maybe that is like uh, certain moles or birthmark uh, like uh, appearance will be there on the skin allergic diseases baby skin will become more allergic and retinal damage if the eyes are not properly covered during phototherapy it can result in retinal damage also so nursing management during phototherapy includes we should make sure that the eyes are covered uh, properly and the genitalia as well and the diaper should be uh, cut short uh, to a smaller size and the distance uh, as required should be maintained place the baby as close to the lights as manufacturer's instruction allow use white cloth or bedding so that the light will be reflected studies have proved that use of white cloths has um, helped in decreasing the bilirubin level considerably and encourage frequent breastfeeding unless intensive phototherapy is not required change the position of the baby every two hours so that all the body surface area is covered monitor the temperature for the valley and daily weighing should be done to monitor that level of dehydration insensible water loss will be more so the baby tend to lose weight assess the extent of jaundice skin for any rash color color of the skin should be assessed do not keep anything on the phototherapy units because it can block the air vents and it can be a fire hazard change the tube lights if irradiance is poor especially when a cfl uh, lamp is used every 6 months uh, this tube needs to be changed and the usage time is uh, less than uh, 1200 hours Actually, it is less than twelve hundred hours. LED have an advantage of more than fifty thousand hours. At the same time, another advantage of LED is baby may not uh, the CFL lamps have a tendency to get heated uh, uh, very much, and the baby may have hyperthermia. Whereas LED do not uh, have that issue. So these are the certain factors which, uh, as nurses, we should keep in mind while uh, giving phototherapy to a baby. So this is a guideline for phototherapy in infants more than 35 weeks or uh, uh, this this chart will uh, show the cut off values for phototherapy this is a, a uh, given by uh, aap and uh, if you see in this there are three lines in this chart the horizontal axis gives the uh, life uh, day of life and hours of the baby age of the baby that is it may be hours or day and the vertical axis gives the TSB level that is the serum bilirubin level in this there are three lines are there the continuous line it is a infants at higher risk 35 to 37 weeks and the uh, next line is infants at medium risk more than or equal to 38 weeks um, and uh, next is uh, dotted lines infants at lower risk so the uh, the risk factor we mentioned here are baby with isoimmune hemolytic anemia g6pd deficiency asphyxia temperature instability sepsis acidosis or hypoalbuminemia babies with any of these conditions will be considered as uh, in a uh, risk level and uh, with that with the age of the baby and the gestation we can classify the baby and uh, considering the tsb level we can plot the uh, cut off value from this chart and based on that we can, if the value falls above the line we can we sh- it, it means that it is above the cut off value and we should start the phototherapy this is for babies more than 35 weeks of age 35 uh, weeks gestation whereas for less than 35 weeks uh, our unit follow nice guidelines next is exchange transfusion uh, uh, this is uh, exchange transfusion we, we have uh, two types one is double volume exchange transfusion and another is partial exchange so double volume exchange transfusion as the name states Uh, it is double the volume of the uh, blood volume of the baby uh, we do it with the double the volume of the blood volume total blood volume of the baby this the cut off value for double volume exchange is if the cord will do it is 5 mg per dl or more and cord hp is 10 g per dl or less these are the two cut off values where uh, the doctor the physician will uh, go for double volume exchange transfusion and in certain conditions we do partial exchange before doing the double volume exchange transfusion that is if baby shows signs of high drops or cardiac decompensation with low pcv less than 35% in this condition we do 
partial exchange with 50 ml per kg of packed cells that is with rbc prbc uh, to restore the oxygenation level before doing dvt if you don't do this baby may crash do, uh, during the double volume exchange transfusion so in this certain conditions when the pcd is less than 35 percentage we do partial exchange before doing double volume exchange transfusion so double volume exchange transfusion as the name states uh, is it is done with the double the volume of the blood volume of the baby it is a push pull technique that is uh, uh, the from the blood bag blood will be withdrawn and it will be pushed and the same amount same aliquot will be removed from the lady uh, baby's body and this is usually done through umbilical venous success uh, in certain conditions you uh, umbilical arterial access or peripheral line may, may be also be used and the aliquot volume that is how many ml per uh, cycle should be removed it depends on the uh, weight of the baby it is usually 5 ml per kg uh, of the baby that is for, if it is for a 3 kg baby the aliquot volume will be 15 mg and the aliquot volume is directly related to the bilirubin clearance also the more the aliquot volume bilirubin clearance will be more and uh, uh, we should monitor bp saturation and heart rate throughout the procedure uh, throughout the procedure and uh, because uh, because we are uh, giving uh, extremely cold blood and uh, donor blood to the baby and uh, as we know uh, there are certain complications uh, in this dvt uh, we will see to that next to next slide let's see what type of blood is given in uh, uh, different conditions if it is rh isomerization that is if the mother's blood group is negative and the baby's blood group is positive baby may be having hyperbilirubinemia baby will be having hyperbilirubinemia in this condition we will give rh uh, negative uh, blood cells uh, in AB plasma that is O blood cells in AB plasma and uh, in AB incompatibility uh, RH compatible and blood group O not that of the baby suspended in AB plasma that is in both the case uh, O RB, uh, blood cells in RBC in AB plasma is preferred for double volume exchange transfusion and in emergency situations when this is not available O negative blood is also used in uh, RHI stabilization for uh, DVT and uh, the volume that is used is double the blood volume of the baby it is usually the total volume would come around 160 to 180 ml per kg that is double the total volume of the baby's blood volume and to uh, this is uh, from the blood the requisition will be sent in such a way that we will get uh, a mix of two third of packed cells in one third of plasma that is the total blood that is uh, that we use for double volume will be having two third of the packed cells and one third of plasma. So again, this is the uh, chart with, which gives us a cutoff value for uh, double volume exchange transfusion, and uh, the horizontal uh, same as that of the phototherapy uh, uh, chart. This all in the horizontal axis it gives the age of the baby in hours and days. Horizontal uh, vertical axis gives the total serum bilirubin. In this also there are three lines, the continuous lines is infants at higher risk and uh, the next line is infants at medium risk and uh, the third line is medium infants at lower risk. Again the risk factors are in isomere, hemolytic anemia, G6PD deficiency, asphyxia, temperature instability, sepsis, acidosis and hypoalbuminemia. Considering these risk factors and gestation of the baby, we will uh, and uh, along with the age, the age of the baby, that is how many days it has been and the serum bilirubin we will plot the cutoff value in this for example a baby uh, with uh, 35 uh, weeks gestation and uh, uh, on the second day or first day of life 24 hours of life and this if the serum bilirubin is uh, 16 then we can see that then we can see that uh, in this so uh, it will come around uh, here that is first day of life 24 hours of life 35 weeks of gestation for 35 weeks we will consider this continuous line so the uh, the we can plot the cut uh, the value at, at this point so this is about the cutoff value so uh, we can say uh, we can say that the baby need uh, double volume exchange next are complications of dvt 
So there are certain clinical adverse events like a baby may have uh, apnea during the procedure, bradycardia may be there, seizures may uh, occur, hypothermia because we are giving cold uh, uh, blood, uh, uh, we are do using for uh, double volume exchange. Need or increase in auto requirement if at all the baby is uh, on oxygen support. Uh, if you do not do it in a strict asepsis, uh, aseptic manner, it can lead to sepsis, arrhythmias and death. And we should make sure that as nurses, we should make sure that the blood we use for double volume exchange, we should uh, we, a use of blood warmer uh, could be beneficial for the baby because increased uh, uh, the blood, if we give it in a higher temperature, it can lead to hemolysis. If we give at a lower temperature, it can lead to hypothermia. Again, it is a, um, a danger uh, situation for the baby uh, if we tend uh, push the baby into hypothermia. And another thing is, uh, biochemical adverse uh, adverse effects like hypocalcemia because of the chelating agents present in the blood that we give uh, it uh, baby uh, may have hypocalcemia so after uh, completing double volume exchange transfusion also we should keep a watch on the baby for hypocalcemia uh, in, uh, for seizure and all then next is hyponatremia and hyperkalemia of course the RBC is uh, when it is in the blood bag tends to uh, hemolysis will be there so it can produce much of the potassium and it can further lead, uh, lead to hyperkalemia in babies so this is one uh, one reason during the double volume exchange baby may have even cardiac arrest as well so uh, we should keep a continuous uh, vigilant monitoring of the vitals of the baby during procedure like bp uh, saturation heart rate uh, should be monitored continuously and And uh, uh, acidosis uh, can be there because uh, the donor milk which comes in the blood bag will be having a pH of less than 7.2 so that it can push the baby into acidosis and the base excess uh, more than minus 10 milliequivalent per liter. So these are certain complications of DVT. Next is pharmacologic management. Phenobarbital is a drug of choice. Uh, it, it improves the hepatic uptake and conjugation and excretion of bilirubin. So this again works in the uh, metabolism of bilirubin and helps in decreasing the bilirubin level in blood. Uh, the prophylactic dosage is 5 mg per kg for 3 to 5 days after birth. And another th uh, drug is uh, IVIG, intravenous immunoglobulin. High dose of IVIG 0.5 to 1 gram per kg has shown to reduce need for exchange transfusion in RH and ABO hemolytic diseases. In our units, usually uh, phototherapy and uh, DB, uh, double volume exchange transmission is practiced. Next, we will see complications of hyperbilirubinemia uh, or uh, uh, this uh, in this, uh, the long term complication if the uh, bilirubin level crosses 15 to 20 mg per dl, uh, it tends to close the blood brain barrier and it can stain the uh, brain. Uh, it can, uh, this unconjugated bilirubin can stain the brain and the high level of bilirubin that is 15 to 20 uh, per uh, mg per deciliter it will cross the blood brain barrier very easily and result in neural injury or necrosis and neuronal loss certain parts of the brain and the cranial nerves may be affected which can result in several manifestations this is also known as bilirubin induced neurological dysfunction so if this is a bind score bind, bind or bilirubin induced neurological dysfunction this is a bind score in this, if you if you see, you can see the various uh, clinical manifestations which the baby may have. Uh, in stage one, the baby may be so sleepy, difficult to awaken, feeding will be poor, tone will be slightly decreased, cry will be high pitched, and uh, feeding will be poor, and the aloneness of eyes or face will be there. In stage one B, uh, baby will be very sleepy, alternatively very irritable as well. Tone will be moderately increased or decreased depending on the arousal state. Uh, neck and back arching will be there. Be, uh, cry may be big, uh, sorry, uh, cry may be shrill and very high pitched. Whereas suck may be poor in this stage 1B and uh, feeding will be poor. Whereas a stage 2, baby will be in a semi coma stage. Apnea will be there, convulsions will be there. Tone will be markedly increased or decreased. Opistonic posturing, that is, back bends and bicycling movements can be seen. Piercing, shrill, inconsolable cry will be there and suck will be absent and feeding also will be absent in this uh, stage and aloneness can be seen abdomen and 
below. And another uh, complication of hyperbilirubinia is uh, deafness and uh, cerebral palsy also can be uh, there. Since it affects the brain it can and uh, certain cranial nerves, it can result in deafness and cerebral palsy also. So, uh, a certain counseling or action what uh, we can do in this uh, hemolytic jaundice, AB or RH incompatibility, what we can do is, uh, if the if you see in this image, it, is, it shows that if the uh, if the first baby is, uh, if the mother is Rh negative and if the firstborn baby is Rh positive, the mother's body will produce antibodies against the baby's blood group. And these antibodies will persist in the mother's body. And when the mother gets pregnant for the second time, and if the ba second baby is also Rh positive, these antibodies will try to fight against the second baby and the baby may be, will be presented with high drops, fetalis and severe uh, complications. So, uh, so, to prevent this, uh, we, one uh, prophylactic treatment that we give is anti-D prophylaxis injection uh, that we give within 72 hours of delivery or it can be uh, given during pregnancy also uh, when we uh, suspect mixing of blood. This, uh, the, the parents, uh, the mother with RH negative blood group should be uh, counseled or educated about this. And finally, role of nurse. In phototherapy, we have already discussed what are the role of nurse in phot during phototherapy. That is, uh, we should make sure that the eyes of the baby is properly covered, genitals should be covered, and diaper should be cut short, and the distance should be maintained uh, as uh, required. Irradiance should be monitored, and uh, baby's skin uh, should be monitored. The feeding can be continued unless it is intensive phototherapy, and uh, uh, if if the radiance is uh, not up to the mark, we should take necessary action to change the uh, lights of the uh, phototherapy unit. And whereas in double volume exchange transfusion, we should be very vigilant during the procedure, like uh, uh, while pre uh, preparing the while procuring the equipment right right from the blood warmer, use of adequate disposables. Uh, uh, st sterile uh, equipment should be used, strict asepsis should be maintained throughout the procedure and effective communication should be there because uh, that uh, while during the procedure how many cycles is being uh, done, uh, whether it was a push or a pull, there is a chart that we maintain during the double volume exchange transmission. The physician will be doing the exchange transmission and the nurse who is taking care of the baby will be standby and she will be uh, monitoring each and every in and out of the push and pull that we do for the baby um, and uh, during the procedure we should keep a close monitoring of the BP that is we set the monitor like uh, in every 5 to 10 cycles the BP will be uh, NIBP will be monitored if there is no uh, uh, invasive article uh, BP monitoring is not there and uh, saturation should be monitored heart rate should be monitored and if at all the baby has any apnea during the procedure immediately, uh, the procedure should be withheld and once the baby is stabilized, the procedure can be continued and uh, and post procedure also, we should keep a watch over the uh, baby as the baby uh, can have hypercalcemia or hyperkalemia and further complications may be there. So, close monitoring of the baby should be there. And uh, uh, for counseling and communication, uh, we should maintain a uh, therapeutic and uh, professional communication uh, with the parents uh, we should make uh, we should educate them that yellow is discoloration of the palms and soles of the baby is a danger sign and the they should seek uh, medical aid immediately sunlight exposure is not effective treatment for uh, jaundice you should uh, educate the parents and uh, uh, after the babies who require dbt uh, uh, will require a hearing test in future so regarding this also we should educate the parents in the uh, follow up uh, for the follow up. So these are the certain uh, a few aspects of uh, pathological jaundice. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And if there is any doubt, please keep in share. Yeah, thank you, Anima, for the quick review about the neonatal jaundice and the um, bilirubin metabolism, the difference between physiological and pathological jaundice. There are a few questions from the participants. I will read out one by one for you. There is a question from Phila Dolly. Why preterm babies are most commonly affected with jaundice? Okay. Uh, 
and the more rbc destruction is the most common cause for uh, uh, this bilirubin uh, sorry jaundice among preterm babies then another question is why babies born to o positive mother tend to have more jaundice than other babies it is not like that <clears throat> if the mother's blood group is o positive and if the baby's blood group is a or b the blood groups are incompatible so the uh, mother's blood group will try to uh, produce uh, will produce antibodies against the baby's blood group that is naturally if we uh, when we transfuse incompatible blood in adults also this is what happens hemolysis will occur same that happens in babies also when the mother's blood is o and the baby's blood is a or b hemolysis will occur in baby's blood group because antibodies will uh, antibodies produced in mother's blood group will fight against the baby's blood group Uh, the main thing is that the, if the mother is o in group the mother blood has both antibodies and the a and and the b antibodies are naturally in the blood so yes. what will happen if the baby is having a group b group or ab incompatibility is there since both antibodies are present in the mother they tend to have more jaundice than other babies other babies mm, then another question from bian danis is pathological jaundice is related to g6pd deficiency Yes, uh, in because I have said that pathological jaundice means jaundice resulting from any from any underlying pathology. So G six in G six period deficiency, it is more prevalent in northern parts of India. It is a deficiency of this enzyme, which results in the uh, hemolysis of the um, RBC. That is, bl more blood cell breakdown will be there, which further results in hyperbilirubinemia. That is related. Uh, that means uh, all pathological jaundice are not related to G six period deficiency. G six period is one of the cause for yes. pathological, pathological jaundice. Yeah. Then another question is: Is all pathological and physiological jaundice require phototherapy? No, all physiological jaundice may not require uh, phototherapy. Certain mild conditions will get resolved by itself, and the pathological jaundice require. Phototherapy and in uh, when the bilirubin is in a higher rate, it requires double volume exchange transfusion as well. It's always depending upon the baby's bilirubin value. And another question is, how thalassemia also causes pathological jaundice? Because of the hemolysis. Yeah, thalassemia will also lead to hemolysis. So the hemolysis will lead to bilirubin accumulation yes, and jaundice. Mm -hmm. Then another question is from Rosemary Jones. She asks, is it correct if we educate a mother that Breastfeeding baby well will helps to reduce the bilirubin level. Mm, that is in physiological jaundice. You can say that if we increase the hydration, we have seen in the metabolism that this gets um, bilirubin gets uh, it's excreted with bile into the GI tract from where it is excreted as urobilinergic and stercobilinergic. So if if we can say that if we hydrate the baby adequately uh, in physiological jaundice. Uh, if if it is like mild jaundice, if we hydrate well, some sort of uh, jaundice will be reduced uh, because of this hydration itself. That is, excretion will be more. It can uh, helps in more clearance of bilirubin from the body. But Then, not in pathological jaundice. Yeah. One more question is there. Question from Indira: Is there any complication after physiological jaundice when the kids grow up? Physiological jaundice do not have that much complications. Uh, we have seen the difference between physiological jaundice and pathological jaundice also uh, pathological jaundice have more complications as compared to uh, physiological jaundice yeah physiological jaundice most of, most often does not lead to any of the complications and another question from talancho uh, chennai tamil they are asking is it necessary to switch uh, switch on the white bulbs throughout the course of phototherapy uh, That's a good question. Something which I missed in the discussion. Uh, in certain uh, uh, phototherapy units, there may be white lights and blue lights. Actually, this white light is for examining the baby. Blue light is the light which helps in 
bilirubin oxidation and uh, this uh, convert, uh, uh, reducing the bilirubin level in baby because we have uh, i have discussed that bilirubin absorbs only the light which is in the blue green spectrum white light is used for examining the baby when the baby is getting phototherapy we can switch off the blue light and use the white light to examine the baby so ideally we have to go for the blue spectrum light for the phototherapy purpose yes. then another question is if mother refuses to uh, give phototherapy to her baby what is the other treatment option for the condition phototherapy uh, if mother refuses we should uh, educate the mother about the uh, necessity of the treatment that is the only option we cannot uh, switch to another thing yeah phototherapy is the main course of treatment for this condition if the mother refuses we have to educate the mother regarding the importance otherwise what will happen the bilirubin will accumulate and can leads to further complications like gonadotropin yes. and or so then it may require further uh, treatment like extension transfusion and or so we try to educate the mother regarding the importance of phototherapy for uh, as a treatment condition so there is no uh, no other doubts from the participants so thank you anu ma'am for the for your wonderful session thank you so much thank you thank you so uh, now we are moving to our next session our next session is on neonatal seizures we have alfi with us to discuss about neonatal seizures she is working as nursing officer in aims new delhi she did her undergraduate and post graduation in uh, pediatric nursing and she has more than 7 years of experience in the area of pediatrics I welcome Alfie on behalf of IACCN. Over to Alfie. Hello. All. So these two hours has been uh, very informative. Now I welcome you all to my session, that is on neonatal seizures. So I would like to share share my screen. Are my slides visible? Yes, it's visible. Okay. So I would like to start with neonatal seizures. So. Coming to the objectives, after at the end of the session, we will be able to understand the classification, pathophysiology, evaluation, management option, and in the professional trained strategies for improving the care of newborn with seizures. So, as an introduction, seizures constitute the most common neurological emergency in neonates, and they have a significant impact on neonatal mortality as well as morbidities with adverse neurological outcome. So, we don't want that. that is why it is important to identify at the early age so by definition what is seizure it is defined as a clinically as occurrence of sudden paroxysmal abnormal alteration of neurological function that is motor behavior or autonomic function at any point from birth to the end of the neonatal period so during neonatal period any occurrence of sudden paroxysmal abnormal alteration In the neurological function, it is termed as seizures. So it is subclassified into three types, and it is epileptic seizures, non-epileptic seizures, or and EEG seizures. So in epileptic seizures, there will be seizure activity corresponding with the EEG changes, and in non-epileptic seizures, there will be seizure activity, but there won't be any corresponding EEG correlate. And in EEG seizures. there will be no clinical seizure present but eeg changes will be there so coming to the epidemiology according to the nnpd database there is 10.3 per 1000 live birth uh, occurrence of seizures 
Then according to a recent study, which was done in March 2022, uh, in low and middle income countries, shows 36 to 90 per thousand live birth. And the incidence was found to increase with decreasing gestation, that is lower the gestation, uh, higher the incidence. That was 20.8 20 per thousand live birth, according to NNPD. Then very low birth weight unit also had fourfold more higher incidence uh, than the, than the uh, uh, normal babies. And that was 36.1 per thousand live birth. Now coming to the etiological factors, there are five major factors which is uh, uh, which is there, and one first one is hypoxic condition, such as HIE and perinatal asphyxia or birth asphyxia. As ma'am Jesse ma'am has already covered asphyxia, we know that due to asphyxia, neonatal seizure can happen. So hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy it constitutes for more than fifty percent of neonatal seizure that occurs and it, in this seizure start within 12 to 24 hours of life. Then second one, second etiological factor is metabolic disturbances such as hypoglycemia or hypocalcemia, which is the most common uh, metabolic disturbance. Then other thing, other uh, metabolic disturbances, disturbances such as hypomagnesemia, hyponatremia, hypernatremia, all can be there. Then third one is intracranial hemorrhage, which includes intraventricular hemorrhage or intraparent camel hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage or subdural hemorrhage. And in, intra, in cases of hemorrhage, uh, seizure is usually noted between the second and seventh day of life. Then fourth one is infection. Infection due to bacterial meningitis, viral encephalitis, or any intrauterine infection which was present during maternal antenatal period that also can lead to seizure, neonatal seizure. Then other factors such as inborn error of metabolism, as we all know, then thrombolic causes, thromboembolic causes due to infarctions of the brain and any congenital brain malformation, which all can lead to uh, these neonatal seizures. Now I'm coining these terms such as 12 to 24 hours of life and second and seventh day of life it's because we can actually uh, have a diagnosis based on the day of life like what can be the cause and we can give, give the management. Now coming to the prevalence, as we have seen and I've said already that more than 50% of cases, sorry, more than 50% of uh, uh, cause is due to HIE. Then second major cause is infection. And the third one is metabolic disorders, rest all, it falls in lower percentage when compared to all three. So HIE is something which should be prevented and should be ruled out at the earliest. Now coming to the classification. This classification is basically uh, based on the clinical manifestation, how the seizure is manifested. So we have, according to the uh, clinical manifestation, Class, it is classified in was neonatal seizure is classified into four types: subtle seizures, clonic seizures, tonic seizures, myoclonic seizures. I will go one by one. Subtle seizures. Subtle, as the name suggests, it is very subtle because it is the manifestation is very mild, and it is often missed because manifestation is that mild. But it constitutes the most. That is, fifty percent of all seizures in neonates is mostly subtle, and it is missed. So, uh, and what are the manifestation, how it is manifested? It is basically ocular movements uh, will be there. That is cycled fluttering or staring and uh, movements can be there. Orofacial lingual movements such as chewing, th tongue thrusting, lip smacking can be there. Then limb movements such as cycling, paddling or boxing kind of movement will be there. Then autonomic phenomena such as tachycardia or bradycardia and apnea. So all these can present, uh, like all these movements are there, but doesn't present uh, to like all symptoms won't be there. Only one, any one of this can be there. Like if, if, uh, there will be either cycle fluttering or staring or chewing or thrusting or lips, lips packing. So 
if anyone only one symptom would be there and sometimes or mostly it is missed so just to make you familiarize with the subtleness video as we can see lips packing movements yes sucking movement is there along with apnea now coming to the other types that is clonic seizure clonic seizure it presents by uh, presents in rhythmic movements of muscle group and it has both fast and slow components that is 1 to 3 jerks per second and it is commonly associated with eeg changes so here is one video you can see there is 1 to 3 jerks per second and both fast and slow components are there rhythmic movements and it also it is also associated with eeg changes then other type is tonic seizure tonic seizure as the name suggests there will be tonicity and this tonicity can uh, manifest such as uh, in the form of flexion or extension so sustained flexion or extension of axial or appendicular muscle groups will be there it can be focal or generalized either one part of brain is affected or the whole, both the part of the brain is affected and it resembles the cerebrate that is tonic extension of all limbs or decorticate posturing that is flexion of upper limbs and extension of lower limbs so it presents that way now the four type that is myoclonic seizures these seizures manifest as single or multiple lightning fast jerks of the upper or lower limbs so we have seen an in chronic seizure also this jerks are there but it differentiate based on the speed so there will be rapid speed of myoclonic jerks and there will be absence of slow return and it is a predilection for the flexor muscle group that that the flexor group of muscle it is it has more affinity towards this in this kind of uh, seizures then eeg changes will be there and uh, that is shown by burst ex suppression pattern and focal sharp waves and his peripheries what is his peripheries it is abnormal interrectal high amplitude waves and a background of irregular spikes as i have shown here like uh, it has fo focal sharp waves and irregular spikes so this is myoclonic seizures as you can see there are rapid lightning jerks of movements of upper and lower limbs as we can see it is different from the clonic seizures so over with the classification now before uh, management of uh, any or before coining the baby as having seizures we have to first differentiate it between the uh, jitterness we have to differentiate with the jitterness so, uh, the difference between convulsion and jitterness is uh, termed, termed in this uh, slide so convulsion is it has both fast and slow components slow movements will be there and fast components will be there and it is provoked by uh, it's not provoked by any kind of stimulation and it does not stop with passive restraint if we restrain the body part then uh, like it does not stop there the neurological examination often show of normal eeg changes and it is often associated with eye movements such as tonic deviation or fixed stare and autonomic changes that is changes in heart rate and drop in saturation whereas in jitterness jitterness has fast movement that is 4 to 6 per second and tremors are of equal amplitude it is provoked by stimulation such as light or noise or hunger and it usually stops with restraint if we restrain that particular body uh, part which is having tremors it will stop there then the neurological examination it usually is normal and it is not associated with any eye movement or any autonomic changes and uh, as we can see in this video 
you can see there is jitteriness of this uh, arm and it has of, it is of equal amplitude and if we strain it it stops now coming to the pathophysiology pathophysiology as we know like neonatal period is a growing period the brain is developing so it is immature so there is imbalance between the excitatory glutamate and deficient uh, GABA that is inhibitory neurotransmitter. So more of excitation excitation is happening over inhibition due to this immature brain development. Certain areas are developed and certain areas of brain are not developed. So because of this imbalance, there is uh, like uh, uh, the neonatal brain is susceptible to uh, getting seizures with any pathophysiology. Then there is neuron, the hy neuronal hyperexcitability state in the neonatal period due to incomplete myelination and, in, and uh, lack of, of neuropeptides. And there can be a genetic mutation also. And the main two genes, uh, like mutation in these two genes. Now coming to the pathophysiology uh, via diagram, I don't want to go in detail. Just a brief explanation. Uh, in left side, we have, in left side, it is presynaptic button of glutamate. That is, this is, left side is excitatory panel and right side is inhibitory panel. So, in left side, when glutamate is released, there will be activation of excitatory, uh, like, there will be, be excitation due to activation of this NMD and AMPA receptors. And there will be influx of calcium and sodium as well. Whereas in the, like in the inhibitory state, upon release of GABA in neurotransmitter, there will be hyperpolarization or inhibition that is happening. And this hyperpolarization is due to the presence of chloride ion, which is mediated by this NKCC, uh, this KCC2 receptor channel. So these two happens in the postsynaptic neuron and thereby creating a balance between the excitation and inhibition in the mature, uh, mature brain. But in immature brain, since they are during this chloride hyperpolarization, this NKCC1 is not acting or opposing, uh, which has to be there. So because of that, chloride, chloride ion deposition will be there and this accumulation leads to hyperexcitability state of the neuron. So this is, and moreover, there is more influx of calcium and the sodium uh, ions in the pre uh, in the presynaptic or in the excitatory uh, synapse, and due to which there is always a state of hyperexcitability in the immature brain, and because of which seizures are happening. Now coming to the approach, so we know that uh, approach it always begins with history. So these five history should be taken. That is seizure history, perinatal history, in family history, antenatal history, and feeding history. So in seizure history, we have to find out if there is any uh, associated movement, such as uh, eye movement, leg movement, what kind of movement was that? So that should be asked and. Uh, if restraint was uh, like uh, applied, then was the like uh, convulsion or jitterness, was it stopping or not? That should be asked. If the baby was awake or asleep during the seizures, then if they, they have any record of that particular event, then also we have to ask for the day of life. But at on which day the seizure has happened. Exactly. Then second history is perinatal history, which includes uh, if there was any fetal distress during the uh, intrapartum period and uh, the upper score when the baby was born, if there was any need for resuscitation or any instrument or assisted delivery was the performed or not, because we know the due to instrumentation and all, birth injury uh, can, can be there or uh, hemorrhage can be there. Then we have to, if there was asphyxia, then we have to know about the what pH. If it was less than seven, 
and base deficit uh, was more than 10 million plum per day. The year was like uh, that in case of severe birth asphyxia. So severe birth asphyxia, we know it can lead to neonatal seizures. Then family history and uh, pertaining to family history, we have to know if there was any consanguinity in marriage was there or not, or uh, if, there, if there is any uh, like uh, history of early neonatal death in the family or seizures or any family member is having seizures or not that we have to ask. Then in antenatal history, we have to uh, check for any intrauterine infection or if the mother had hypothermia during the third trimester or not. Then maternal di diabetes, as we know with maternal diabetes, there is uh, macrosomia, which can lead to, uh, which can end up in turn lead to difficult delivery. So that can lead to trauma, which can ultimately lead to seizures. Then addiction, addiction to narcotics. If it was there, then it can also lead to seizures. Then feeding history. So if the baby had lethargy or vomiting or drowsiness after drowsiness after initiation of breastfeeding, it was it all suggests inborn error of metabolism. So if inborn error of metabolism is there, then seizure is a predictable outcome. Then second approach is by examination. So examination, as we know, we have to check for vital signs, temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, BP and CFT. Temperature because hyperparexia can lead to seizure uh, and hypothermia also can lead to seizure. Then uh, changes in heart rate, respiratory rate, BP, hypo, BP and CFT because hypoperfusion also leads to seizures. Then general examination, period of gestation has to be find out, has to be taken. Uh, then uh, birth weight and weight for age, it should be ruled out because we know uh, as we have discussed in incidents, low birth weight, uh, lead, like higher higher incidence of neonatal seizure was there in case of low birth weight. Then any dysmorphism, if it is present or not, then jitteriness also we have to look for it. Then CN, in CNS examination, we have to see for the tone, tone uh, appropriate to period of gestation, if, uh, if it is there or not. Then in fundus examination, we have to rule out chorioretinitis and uh, which suggests maternal infection. Then bulging fontanel, because we know bulging fontanel is, is one of the sign of uh, meningitis. Then in systemics examination, we have to check for hepatosplenomegaly uh, and the urine order, then hypopigmented stone spot or ash leaf spot, all suggest inborn error of metabolism and jaundice or pernicturus. Then third approach is via investigations and investigation is classified into essential investigation and additional in investigations. Essential investigation has to be done in all unit with the presenting with seizures. So as soon as the baby is presenting a seizure, blood sugar and blood sodium and calcium has to be sent for any to rule out any hypoglycemia or hypocalcemia uh, sequel. Then CSF examination should be done then cranial ultrasound in order to rule out any uh, hemorrhage, it should be done. Then EEG or amplitude integrated EEG should be done in all neonatal seizures in order to identify what kind of seizure it is. And if it is seizure, then if it is uh, associated with any AEG changes in order to predict the outcome of the baby or prognosis of the baby. Then in additional investigation, hematocrit uh, show, should be uh, done in order to, uh, in case of plethoric or at risk polycythemia, as we know, uh, in these two conditions, there will be hypoperfusion and which, which can lead to seizures. Then serum bilirubin in order to check for any conitrous. Serum magnesium, if it is low, uh, 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 it has to be ruled out. Then ABG has to be done. Then CT or MRI in order to see for the prognosis or the diagnostic uh, like uh, bleeding and all, hemorrhage if it is there, what part of brain is affected or not has to be screened. Then torch screen should be done in case of maternal infection. Then IEM workup if the baby is having interactable seizures or not responding to any AEDs, then it has to be done. So there's a note there that CSF study can be withheld temporarily 
if there is severe cardiorespiratory compromise is present or it can also be omitted in case of severe birth asphyxia. So the fifth is management. So management is basically in three steps. That is first one is initial management. Then second is correction of hypoglycemia or hypocalcemia. Then third is initiation of anti-epileptic drugs. So initial management includes TABC, that is temperature regulation, airway, securing of airway, breathing and circulation. Then if there is any need for oxygenation in case of drop in saturation and all, then if there, uh, then IV access need to be obtained. Then after IV access, sampling should be obtained. Sampling of blood sugar and uh, blood serum um, calcium should be obtained. Then in, in correction, if there is hypoglycemia or hypocalcemia, if any of these uh, is present, then it should be corrected. So hypoglycemia is blood sugar less than 45 mg per dl and hypocalcemia is total serum bilirubin less than 7 mg per dl and or the ionized calcium is less than 3 mg per dl. So if it is there, then it should be treated. Then if uh, both, uh, in spite of correcting both, or if it is not present, if it, uh, despite of that seizure is present, then anti-epileptic drug initiation should be done. So, initial management, as I have said already, as soon as the baby present with the uh, seizures, it has to be differentiated from the jitteriness or other abnormal moments. And after differentiating, if you conclude that it is seizure, then we have to go with the uh, initial management that is securing airway, breathing, circulation, temperature, and oxygenation and IV access. So as soon as we get an IV access, we have to rule out for hypoglycemia and hypocalcemia. So if less blood glucose is less than 45 mg per dl, then we have to give 2 ml per kg of 10% of dextrose IV straight away. Then we have to uh, start the maintenance dose. Then if the blood glucose is more than 45 mg per dl, then we are starting with phenobarbital at a dose of 20 mg per kg IV slowly over 20 minutes. Now, despite of giving glucose infusion, if seizure continue, then again, we are going with the anti-epileptic drug and the first choice of drug is phenobarbital. And even after giving phenobarbital, seizure continues, then we have to repeat phenobarbitone dose at 10 mg per kg and it can be re repeated every 30 minutes until we reach a total of 40 mg per kg. And even after that, if the seizure continues, then IV phenotoin 20 mg per kg slowly over 20 minutes can be given. And even after the loading dose of phenotoin, and it phenotoin should be given under cardiac monitoring. And even after the loading dose of phenytoin, uh, uh, after if seizure is persisting, then a repeat dose of 10 mg per kg can be given. And if the seizure persists even after that, then we have to consider other options such as IV low pump, And it is given at a rate of 0 0.05 mg per kg bolus over two to five minutes. And if no seizure, then ongoing care. And even after low razapam seizure continues, then other anti-epileptic drugs will should be considered. I will come to it later. So low razapam should be given only if there is ventilation facilities are available because it causes severe respiratory depression. So if it is not available, then we have to continue with phenytoin only or go with phenytoin. Now uh, the second. Uh, like uh, we have checked the blood and the serum calcium, if it comes low, that is less than 7 mg per dl, as we have mentioned earlier, then IV calcium of 2 ml per kg of 10% calcium gluconate should be given as loading dose IV. And if the seizure is continuing, then we'll go with anti-epileptic drug. And if there is no seizure, then we'll go with uh, oral calcium. And for IV calcium also, cardiac monitoring should be done. Uh, 
So coming uh, coming to hypoglycemia, as I've already mentioned, two ml per kg of ten percent dextrose as bolus in, uh, injection, and a continuous infusion of six to eight mg per kg per minute as maintenance should be given. And in hypoglycemia, two ml per kg of ten percent calcium gluconate IV over ten minutes under strict cardiac monitoring should be given. And then a maintenance dose of one to two ml per kg dose every six to eight hourly should be given. If we have ruled out both uh, hypoglycemia and uh, hypocalcemia, and despite of uh, ruling out both the cause, if still seizure persists, then we are going with the anti-epileptic drugs. So phenobarbital, it is a drug of choice. And it should not exceed more than one mg per kg per minute. And the maintenance dose of phenobarbital is three to five mg per kg per day in one to two divided doses. And it is started twelve hours after the loading dose. After giving the loading dose, after twelve hours, we have to go with the maintenance dose. Then second uh, drug is phenytoin. Like if phenobarbital is not working, or if there is any adverse effect with the phenobarbital, then the second drug of choice is pheno phenytoin. And this phenotoin is given uh, a loading dose. We have already discussed maintenance doses three to five mg per kg per day. Maximum of eight mg per kg per day in two to four divided doses is considered. And this also should not go beyond one mg per kg per minute of infusion. And if uh, and first phenotoin is given uh, like if if it is available, then it should be preferred over phenotoin because it has less side effects. So phenytoin equivalence. Uh, so it is. It comes as a fin. Uh, it is calculated for, on the basis of phenytoin equivalence. That is, one point five mg per kg of first phenytoin is equivalent to one mg per kg of fin, uh, of phenytoin. So the calculation is based on this equivalent. Now say other uh, drug of choice is lorazepam. Lorazepam only. Given in facilities where uh, mechanical ventilation is available, so it is given as a dose of 0.05 mg per kg IV bolus over two to five minutes should be given slowly and should be given under monitoring. Then, if uh, lorazepam or midazolam, it can be give, given midazolam at 0.015 mg per kg IV bolus. Followed by an infusion of 0.1 to 0.4 mg per kg per hour in case of like if uh, other drugs are not working. Now other drugs, other advanced drugs are lidocaine, uh, with then paraldehyde, and lidocaine should not be administered with phenytoin. It is given as a dose of 4 mg per kg, and uh, followed by an infusion of 2 mg per kg per hour. And it has an adverse effect of arrhythmia, hypotension, and seizures. So it, all these drugs should be given under cardiac monitoring. Paraldehyde is given as IM or per rectal route. It also has adverse effect of pulmonary hemorrhage, pulmonary edema, hypotension, and liver injury. So the, while giving these drugs, serum bilirubin, serum uh, electrolyte level should be checked. Then sodium valproate, the dose is uh, 20 to 25 mg per kg per day, followed by 5 to 10 mg per kg uh, every 12 hours per rectal or IV. It is considered. Then Vega Batrin, uh, that is 50 mg per kg per day, and it is used in unit with infantile spasm. That is another type of seizures. Uh, and it's, that infantile spasm can lead to epilepsy in the later stages of life. So that is more serious condition. And it is very rare. Then topiramide. Topiramide is uh, 3 mg per kg dose may we continue. Then pyridoxine. Pyridoxine is uh, given in uh, pyridoxine dependent epilepsy, which is an inborn error of metabolism. Uh, and it has problem with vitamin 6. Uh, by vitamin B6 metabolism. So it is given as IM group. So the pharmaco 
कंट्रोल then coming to the weaning of ad that is uh, after the seizure is controlled or resolved with this anti epileptic drug this anti epileptic drug should be weaned because it has lot of adverse outcome when it comes to uh, the pathophysiology like path pharmacokinetics it will affect the liver it will affect the other systemic organs so it should be continued as soon as possible so the flow chart discontinuate is if the baby is on anti convulsant therapy then the all like drug should be weaned except for phenobarbital once seizure is controlled then a neuro neurological examination prior to discharge should be performed and if it is normal then phenobarbital can be stopped straight away and if it is abnormal then phenobarbital is continued for one month at maintenance dose then uh, at, after one month repeat neurological examination is done and if it is normal then we have to taper other drugs taper the drugs over two weeks and if it is abnormal then eeg should be evaluated and if it is normally eeg then we have to taper the drugs over two weeks then abnormal eeg is there then uh, continue the drug for three months and reassess after three months then after like after initial management itself the seizure has stopped then start maintain and we have started with the uh, maintenance dose of ing per kg per hourly then we have to monitor for recurrence of any seizures and if there is no clinical seizures in the next 72 hours then if controlled by phenobarbital only phenobarbital is was given during that time then stop without tapering the doses and if it was controlled by more than one drug then stop the drugs one by one and phenobarbital should be stopped at the last then if uh, recurrence of seizure was is present then we have to treat uh, with another other uh, anti epileptic drugs now other promising advances are there such as algorithm for neonatal uh, seizure recognition It's like every facility is using this algorithm in order to identify the seizure and to differentiate and how to manage it initially so this is a prom promising advances because it is uh, giving a positive outcome to the uh, care of the neonate with seizure then there is a second one is uh, nicm nurse that is neuro intensive care nursery for nurse or uh, practitioner is there where uh, like the infants or the unit with seizure they are cared intensively and they are also responsible for uh, the diagnostic procedures and other uh, relevant activities that has to be done in a unit with seizure basically providing good care now the prognosis of neonatal seizure is a good prognosis is there when if the seizure is due to subarachnoid hemorrhage and in case of late onset hypocalcemia and if the seizure is of focal clonic uh, origin then if there is normal interictal eeg present then intermediate prognosis if in case of Uh, the seizure is due to ECNS infection or hypohypoxic ischemia. Then poor prognosis if the seizure is due to hypoglycemia, that is in the early stages of life or the early hour of life. If hypoglycemia uh, was there, then the prognosis is poor. Then there will, if there is cerebral malformation and meningitis, then if the seizure is of myoclonic origin, if there is intractable seizures present. and if the eeg uh, waves 
shows bus suspension, uh, suppression or persistent low voltage EEG, then the prognosis is poor. Then in case of persisting neurological abnormalities on clinical examination, that is also the, the outcome is poor. And in case of very low birth weight and if the POG is less, that also prognosis has shown to be poor. Now coming to the nursing assessment, that is history. History, as I already said in the approach, like all this history has to be taken. Then examination of the newborn pertaining to what kind of seizure is there, what kind of movements the baby is presenting with, it has to be examined along with other comorbidities if it is present or not. Then recognize when the infant is having seizure so that the therapeutic therapy can be instituted as fast as possible. Then we have to observe the res uh, response to the therapy and any further evidence of seizure of any other symptomology. It should be ruled. Then nursing diagnosis suggests decreased intracranial adaptive ca capacity related to compression of brain tissue due to intra increased intracranial pressure resulting in brain injury. This for an effective uh, tissue perfusion related to ICP alteration. This for injury related to altered level of consciousness, weakness or loss of metal muscle co coordination. It can lead to injury. So it has to be prevented. Then delayed growth and development related to preterm birth and prolonged NICU stay. Disturbed sensory perception related to presence of neurological lesion. Then risk of infection related to surgical intervention, imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirement due to vomiting or other feeding issues. So in nursing intervention, emergency care and observation during seizure should be performed. And first aid measures such as uh, safety measures should be taken and also first line uh, drug of choice should be uh, kept ready. Then if the baby is having seizure, then we have to uh, make sure that the baby is uh, lying on the flat surface. There is no injury, like uh, risk of fall. Then we have to loosen the tight rope, remove dangerous objects from the area. Then uh, after the seizure, we have to turn the child to one side so that saliva or any uh, secretion can be ruled out. Then we have to check for the breathing pattern of the baby. Then observe child until fully conscious. And if there was any injury, it should be treated and we have to minimize the stimuli. We have to also observe for the infant behavior and we have to interpret that behavior to the parents so that they will know that what kind uh, they will know that baby is having seizures and they will uh, identify the the degree of extent uh, of uh, problem that is happening in the child and it will and we have to ensure the thermo neutral environment monitor for any adverse effect due to AEDs by repeated monitoring and also by repeated uh, having a check on the electrolyte levels. Then recording or reporting of the seizure events should be notified to physician at the same time and uh, right time, maintaining the required nutritional, whether it is parental or enteral, hydration should be maintained. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alpi, for, for the comprehensive coverage uh, regarding neonatal seizure. So uh, you have few questions uh, regarding this topic. First question is, why babies with meconium aspiration syndrome are more prone to develop seizures? Uh, in meconium aspiration syndrome, Meconium aspiration syndrome, as we see, there, there will be concurrent uh, respiratory distress will be there. And because of hypoxia or anoxia to the brain tissues, seizure is... Yeah, the main cause is hy uh, hypoxia, which is occurring to the brain tissue. And another question is, what is the difference between seizure, epilepsy and convulsion? Seizure, epilepsy and convulsion. Uh, epilepsy is a broader term. While seizures is the clinical manifestation that the baby is showing, we can term it as seizure. And convulsion is uh, more or less same with the seizures only. Uh, so epilepsy is a broader term. 
yeah seizure is mainly the electrical disturbance which is occurring in the brain and the muscle twitching and the movements which is occurring is termed as seizure and the recurrent seizure is termed as convulsions so with this we came to the end of this uh, neonatal seizure and we are moving to our last session that is on neonatal sepsis so we have divya ma with us she is currently pursuing her phd from karlstad university sweden she did her masters in pediatric nursing from olandi institute of medical sciences new delhi and currently she is pursuing phd and also working as lecturer in department of health at karlstad university sweden i welcome you ma'am on behalf of iscn over to you ma'am thank you ambali uh it's it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, thank you for the, to the organizers for giving the opportunity uh, to uh, have a session uh, today here and uh, the organizers have done a great job in organizing such a relevant topic uh, i hope you are able to see my powerpoint and you are seeing the the wider powerpoint not the notes pages is that what you are seeing ambali Uh, uh no ma'am you have to put in the slide show mode it's not yet in the slide show i got it okay uh so here we swap how about now uh yeah it's fine now it's better now okay so uh neonatal sepsis so my focus would be mainly on the manifestation and management part of it so moving on to the definition so the term neonatal sepsis is used to designate a systematic systemic condition of bacterial viral or fungal origin that is associated with hemodynamic changes and other clinical manifestation and it results in substantial morbidity and mortality so there is uh, an obvious hemodynamic change and other clinical manifestation which is associated associated with it, the the infection and that is what uh, we call as neonatal sepsis and uh, in literature there is no uh, definite consensus on the definition of this topic so uh, still uh, there is the in literature you would find a lot other variety of definition regarding neonatal sepsis moving on to classification so neonatal sepsis can be broadly classified into early onset sepsis and late onset sepsis so uh, early onset sepsis it is uh, usually vertically acquired that is from the mother to the child and it presents usually between birth to 72 hours of life uh, it can go up to one week of life as per some literature and uh, uh, the the 85 percentage of the neonatal the early onset uh, 85 percentage of early onset neonatal sepsis is uh, presented within the first 24 hours of life and the common form of neonatal sepsis early onset neonatal sepsis is pneumonia uh, late onset it's usually acquired horizontally it can be either from the neonates and environment but it is often a hospital acquired so when the baby is in the neonatal icu or in some other unit for some uh, prolonged treatment then uh, usually we see late onset sepsis but it could also be delayed presentation of the vertically acquired pathogen and it usually presents after 72 hours the common forms are bacteremia and meningitis and uh, in early onset sepsis the usual causative organism is group b streptococcus and even e coli uh, and in case of late onset sepsis what we see usually is uh, klebsiella pneumoniae and as well as uh, Uh, in case of that is in case of hospital acquired one in case of community acquired uh, late onset sepsis it's usually e coli and staphylococcus aureus so moving on to what are the risk factors for uh, sepsis so un, in case of early onset sepsis the common risk factors are premature prolonged or preterm rupture of membranes premature birth uh if the mother is having urinary tract infection during her pregnancy chorio amnionitis maternal fever which is greater than 100.4 degree fahrenheit 
low Apgar score at birth, less than six at one or five minutes. Uh, if the baby is receiving poor prenatal, uh, if the mother is receiving poor prenatal care, uh, poor maternal nutrition, low birth weight baby, difficult delivery, birth asphyxia, meconium staining and congenital anomalies. And there are many more risk factors as well. So these are the main ones. Uh, in case of late onset sepsis, uh, the risk factors are, again, prematurity is a risk factor. Invasive procedures like central venous catheterization, uh, if the catheter remains for greater than 10 days, then there is more risk of late onset sepsis, urinary catheterization, etc. Chronic mechanical ventilation or continuous positive pressure uh, pressure that a CPAP support if the baby is having or if the baby is on nasal cannula, even that is a risk factor. Failure to start enteral feeding is a risk factor. Use of uh, H2 receptor blockers or proton pump inhibitor drugs are risk factor and gastrointestinal tract pathology could be a risk factor for late onset sepsis. Moving on to what are the manifestations of uh, sepsis, neonatal sepsis. So they can vary. The manifestation can vary from very non-specific signs to uh, symptoms and signs which are very focal, uh, like for example, abscess. There could be vital signs derangement. Uh, the baby could present uh, in as hypothermia or even fever. So usually it is the preterm babies who present in it as hypothermia and in term babies, we often see fever. Cardiac manifestations could be there like tachycardia or bradycardia, signs of poor perfusion, uh, like cool and pale extremities, hypotension, a rapid thready pulse and uh, edema. Respiratory symptoms, which is the most common form of uh, neonatal sepsis manifestation we see, grunting, nasal flare, flaring, uh, chest retractions, cyanosis, tachypnea or irregular respiration, and episodes of apnea. Neurological manifestations could be irritability, lethargy, tremors, seizures, irregular respiration, high pitch cry, hypotonia, hypoactive deep tendon reflexes, and abnormal primitive reflexes. There could be gastrointestinal manifestations like decreased feeding, vomiting, diarrhea, jaundice, abdominal distension, and hepatosplenomegaly. Metabolic uh, could be presented as in the form of having hypoglycemia, baby could present with hyperglycemia, metabolic acidosis, and jaundice. Or the baby can present in the form of oliguria, having oliguria. And also in the skin, there could be manifestations like tachyae, impetigo, cellulitis, and abscess. Moving on to what are the diagnostic tests? So uh, usually uh, a complete blood cell count as well as differential count is done. The C-reactive protein levels and other infection markers are looked for, and the gold standard remains culture of blood, urine swab, and cerebrospinal fluid samples. Also, uh, we can do PCR and other quantitative real-time amplification systems like uh, qPCR. So uh, it's widely used nowadays because culture will take time it needs up to 48 hours to show if there is growth of organism, whereas PCR and qPCR are faster, and we would get to know if there is the uh, uh, DNA of the organism present. So the, so the diagnosis uh, is a little more quicker if we use PCR or qPCR. And with qPCR, the amount of sample, blood sample required is also much lesser so it's much more easier in that way uh, imaging 
can also be used like chest radiography to evaluate if there is any pulmonary involvement. Uh, computed tomography or magnetic resonance imaging can be used if we are suspecting meningitis and also ultrasonography if uh, there is, uh, we are suspecting uh, um, any uh, infections in the uh, gastrointestinal tract. Moving on to uh, management. So uh, in the medical management, uh, for sepsis, usually we, in case of uh, clinical, strong clinical suspicion and uh, signs and symptoms, they, we start off usually with empiric therapy of antibiotics. So usually it is a combination of beta-lactam aminopensilin and an aminoglycoside, which is started. In case the baby is not, uh, in case the blood culture results are negative and the baby doesn't show any more uh, signs and symptoms of sepsis, then the uh, antibiotic is discontinued within 36 to 48 hours. Um, um, I, I work in Sweden and here in Sweden, what we usually use uh, as an empiric therapy is benzyl penicillin in case of early onset sepsis along with tobramycin. And if it is a late onset sepsis, then we use cef ceftoxim along with uh, tobramycin again. Uh, directed therapy. So once we have the, uh, once we know what organism uh, is is in the blood culture or in other sample cultures, and if we, when we have the sensitivity of the pathogen, then we can go for pathogen directed antibiotic therapy. So it would be definitely be based on antibiotic sensitivity, and uh, the antibiotic therapy can also vary based on sites of infection. Moving on to uh, other um, medical management measures. So we can also use certain adjunctive therapy like granulocyte transfusions, granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factors, Granul uh, and as well as intravenous immunoglobulin. So what the granulocyte uh, transfusions and the GMC, uh, CSF and the GCSF does is they increase the neutrophil uh, activity as well as the neutrophil production in the baby uh, in the neonate and thereby help stimulate uh, help in, uh, uh, in the defense, body's defense. Uh, and intravenous immunoglobulin is administered usually, especially in case of preterm babies, because uh, uh, it is only after 32 weeks that the mother's immunoglobulins uh, get transferred to the baby, uh, to the fetus via the placenta. So if the baby is born before 32 weeks, they will lack the maternal immunoglobulins. And in that case, the IVIG treatment is quite helpful in giving, helping the baby to defend uh, the infection. Moving on to nursing management. So what is our main role? Uh, so the sepsis, especially in case of, case of late onset sepsis, we can take a lot of preventive measures. So prevention is always better than cure. Uh, so uh, following strict hygiene routines in the unit, uh, following barrier nursing and standard infection protocols, isolating if the, uh, any communicable cases of infection if they are in the unit, so isolating them to a special room or so, and periodic surveillance of nosocomial infections, so especially in the neonatal units and all. We do periodic surveillance of nosocomial infections like swabbing, uh, swab culture of the unit and all that. Uh, so uh, another thing which we use here in Sweden is uh, hero score. So uh, this is a picture of a hero monitor. So hero stands for heart rate observation. So whenever uh, neonates have uh, sepsis, it is usually found that they have uh, heart rate decelerations uh, and also they do not have much uh, heart rate variability as well, uh, just like uh, in case of a, a fetus who is in distress. So the same thing happens in a neonate who has neonatal sepsis. So the monitor, what it does is it looks for heart rate uh, variability 
and heart rate deceleration and it gives a collective score every one hour so we get an hourly score and this score acts like an early warning system uh, uh, to detect sepsis so it is like an early warning sign for uh, sepsis so here uh, sometimes uh, we combine that uh, hero score with clinical score for better predictability so uh, below what you see here is is the uh, chart where clinical score is an example by Fairchild and Ashner who has uh, of um, com combining uh, hero score along with clinical score so here you can see if the hero score is high that is if the hero score is three or so then uh, uh, then the uh, it is considered to be in the red zone or the neonate is in very very high risk of infection uh, whereas if it is uh, if the hero score is high but at the same time if the clinical score is zero you can see on the second uh, column here the score is in the yellow zone so it is lesser risk um, one thing i forgot to tell is uh, the hero score uh, scoring so it's if the score is one or less than one like 0 0.4 0 0.7 or so then there is very low risk of infection whereas a score of more than one uh, and two or more is considered to be a uh, higher risk so as the score increases the risk also increases and uh, the normal uh, the cardiac monitors uh, we cannot uh, they do not give us the they do uh, the heart rate decelerations and heart rate variability so that is uh, very subtle and that cannot be detected on a normal cardiac monitor and that's why we need to use a special hero monitor for obtaining this hero score Moving on to the uh, next one, which is uh, monitoring. So there's uh, monitoring plays an important role here. Uh, so we need to continuously monitor the neonate for uh, temperature variations, heart rate, ECG, respiratory rate, saturation, etc. Uh, also, we need to look for the urine output of the baby and monitor weight when the baby is under our care. Also, uh, we look for pediatric, uh, we take the help of pediatric early warning scores, uh, which is uh, designed for zero to three month old. Uh, we have a Swedish version of it, which we use here. And uh, this is not meant for neonatal units. This is mainly meant if the baby is coming from home with signs and symptoms of uh, sepsis of, or any other uh, illnesses to the emergency unit or any other units. So this, sorry, this is uh, the uh, Swedish uh, pediatric early warning score. So it looks for uh, breathing, circulation, and neurology. Um, and in, under breathing, so this is in Swedish. So you have the the components I have uh, mentioned here in English. So uh, under breathing, we have components like respiratory rate, we have apnea, we have uh, respiratory effort oxygen saturation and supplemental oxygen and under circulation we have pulse rate capillary refill skin color and under neurology we have level of consciousness muscle tone and behavior so in case the baby falls under the red category uh, uh, yellow category or the the amber category there is a related uh, action which we need to take so this is a, a guide to the action. So in case the score, we get a score of zero to one, then the it, it is in the green zone and uh, it, uh, the child is quite, the baby is quite okay. And we can, we just need to continue doing the uh, pediatric early warning system monitoring every eight hours. Whereas if it is in the amber region, if it is two to three score, then we need to, uh, the, the nurse registered nurse will be informed and she will be doing the assessment every 
uh, four hours. Um, usually in uh, Sweden, we also have assistant nurses. Uh, the nursing assistants here are uh, have a special training, so they uh, can do the uh, early warning system and the monitorings and such things. That's why here it is written that it is the, uh, I said that the registered nurse will be informed. Um, and if there is a score of three in any of one parameter, then every hourly monitoring is recommended and the doctor is informed and the doctor would need to do assessment and take further action. If the score is four uh, or to five, it is again hourly monitoring and uh, the doctor is need to be, doctors need to be informed and further action need to be taken. If the score is uh, six to nine, then it is in the red zone. And uh, if the neonate falls into this zone, then uh, the neonate definitely requires continuous monitoring and require intensive care in a special facility. Also, um, we have another uh, uh, system known as newborn early warning system. Uh, from the uh, National Health Services, which is used in the National Health Service hospitals in the UK. So um, this is an exam, this is a chart uh, of a newborn early warning system. So it's, it's somewhat similar to the uh, other one, which I, the SWE pediatric early warning score, which I showed you. But here they look for temperature, respiratory rate, heart rate, saturation, and neurological status. And here also similar to the earlier one, there is the uh, red zones, the green zones, the yellow zones, yellow or the amber zones. So if the baby falls into the, if the, uh, if the measurements of the neonate is in the green zone, then we just need to continue observation and we do not need to take any action. Whereas if it, if there is one observation in the amber or yellow zone, then the doctor and the nurse practitioner, the neonatal nurse, advanced nurse practitioner is informed and the observations are repeated every 30 minutes. If there is two or more observations in the amber or yellow category, then immediately the doctor is called or the and the uh, neonatal nurse practitioner is called for urgent medical review. Uh, again, if there is one or more observation in the red zone, then uh, it's the same, the immediate review by the doctor and neonatal nurse practitioner is being requested. Um, and uh, this, this is a description of when we need to do observations as per the neonatal newborn early warning system. So if the if there is a premature rupture of membrane greater than 18 hours in the mother, maternal group B streptococcal infections, significant meconium, light meconium, or if there are some other reasons, then uh, the, do, uh, the physician uh, can recommend uh, the nurses to do the newborn early warning uh, system observations. And uh, if it is rec uh, recommended, if it is asked to be done, then it is observed for the first 12 hours of age. And uh, the observations are performed at one and two hours of age. And after that, every two hours until the neonate is 12 hours old. And if there is no further uh, observations requested, then it is not uh, required. Uh, other uh, measures, we need to uh, maintain strict aseptic measures, like I had said in the preventive part as well. So barrier nursing and standard precautions have to be maintained while caring for a neonate with neonatal sepsis. Uh, and then we need to also um, maintain a thermal neutral environment so that the baby can uh, main, um, regulate the temperature. So both overheating and underheating is harmful for the neonate uh, because it leads to increased metabolism and uh, oxygen demand in the baby. And uh, we can uh, use radiant warmer or incubator or kangaroo mother care and cl or clothing and blankets as per the unit in, uh, in which the baby is. And one thing to be uh, uh, looked into is to warm all objects before it comes into contact with the neonate. 
uh, education administration. So uh, that is that plays a very important role in case of neonatal sepsis, as we need to administer antibiotics. So uh, highly trained staff and judicious handling is required to administer uh, tighter doses of uh, small, tighter, very small doses of antibiotics. Uh, nutrition. So if the baby is still on breastfeeding, then support breastfeeding. If not, if it, the baby is on nasogastric feeding or so, then uh, provide enteral feedings or nas uh, nasogastric feedings. If the baby is uh, unable to take and uh, orally, and if is, the baby is on IV fluids, then it, the baby needs to be given controlled infusions through an infusion pump. Uh, other important areas are uh, facilitating parent-infant relationship. So when the baby is having a neonatal sepsis and if the baby is sick, then the baby will be cared for, care, uh, cared for in the intensive care neonatal unit. And in that case, there is always a separation between the parent and the infant, which is going to happen. So as much as possible, we need to facilitate parent-infant relationship through kangaroo mother care, if possible, to breastfeeding, etc. Uh, parental education and support by us is also very important because the parents could be very stressed and anxious during this time. So uh, we need to support and educate them. And uh, new, newborn individualized development care and assessment program uh, NIDCAP. So the uh, NIDCAP way of caring is recommended in case of preterm neonates who are uh, in the neonatal units. So this way of caring is, uh, it is not required for a term infant, but for a preterm infant. And uh, we practice it a lot here in Sweden. Uh, it is because uh, the preterm infant's brain is not fully developed and uh, is uh, exposed to a lot of uh, additional stimulus like light, touch, pain, etc. in the neonatal ICU uh, when the baby had to be in the mother's uterus without any such excessive stimulation. So to promote optimal cognitive growth of the New and developmental growth of the neonates brain. This uh, method has been formulated. So what uh, we do is in NICAP way of caring, the baby is cared, uh, baby, while we uh, do any kind of procedures like feeding or blood collection or anything, the baby is observed in a formalized way uh, for any signs of uh, irritability or uh, withdrawal from that particular uh, procedure or stimulus. And if it is there, uh, the we try to adjust the environment and the stimuli around the baby uh, so that it is th the baby can have less stimulation. And it is quite individualized because uh, some procedures like feeding, maybe the baby is withdrawing because it is untimely. So uh, maybe that particular neonate requires a little more adjustment in timing. So it's something which we do in our NICUs as well, but it is, it's just that the same thing has been a little more uh, formalized and structured and put forth uh, so that we are more aware of it and we, we take a little more care about it. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we need to focus a lot on preventive measure in order to uh, prevent neonatal sepsis, especially the late onset neonatal sepsis. And if there is a proper prenatal care, then early onset neonatal sepsis can also be prevented to some extent. Uh, we need to adapt our nursing care uh, for babies based on the baby's individual needs. And also, uh, if a baby with neonatal sepsis is admitted, we need to as far as possible, encourage parent-child bonding. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Divya Ma'am, for the wonderful uh, coverage of this topic. It was really nice to hear from you. Thank you, Ampli. <clears throat>
So this was the last scientific session of today's webinar. So I just would like to uh, remind the participants that the post posters link is available in the comment box, not in the chat box. So kindly fill the post test to get the certificate. You should score minimum 23 out of 30 to get the certificate. If you are not able to get 23 in the first attempt, you can do the test again. And if you successfully complete the post test, you will get the certificate within two weeks. And I hope I will see you all in the next webinar, which is on 24th of April. So with this, we came to the end of today's webinar. And I would like to thank all our dignitaries, Dr. Poonam Joshi Ma'am, Dr. Mini George Ma'am, for their presence, support, and spending their valuable time with us despite of their busy schedule. And I would like to thank our resource person, Ms. Jesse Ma'am, Alfie Ma'am, Anu Ma'am, and Divya Ma'am, uh, for being with us and to cover all the important aspects of neonatal emergencies despite of their busy, hectic working schedule. And I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Indian Society of Emergency and Cardiac Nurses Academy Council for giving me an opportunity to moderate this webinar. My heartfelt thanks to Fami sir, Shaukat sir, Matthew sir, Jessel sir, Sajin sir, and each and everyone in the Academy Council for helping me behind the screen for the successful completion of this webinar. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the participants who participated actively in this webinar. Without them, this program could not be successful. And I apologize for not sticking to the time. And also, if I left out anyone, I, I apologize for that. And I express my heartfelt thanks to one and all for being with us during this journey. Thank you.